I don't feel like I fit in at all. Why not? I've always very much been, after I float away, I just kind of sit there by myself or walk there by myself. And oftentimes that's just for a few seconds, but sometimes that's an entire mile. That's exactly what we need. We need community there. We need people to realize when we're gone. And I saw a homeless man probably five feet away from me, like trying to jog with me. But on his leg that's facing me, imagine a machete. But as soon as he said that, I was straight out of that like, TV show, Scared Straight. And it's a good I felt as if it was somewhat of a death sentence in my soul. Because these people within themselves made money their God. And so what if like we rewrote those stories and said we're going to follow our intuition. And from now on, starting today, we will only be drawn to people that are... I was planning my escape. And I glorified it in my head as this incredible dream, which it was and is. But it was definitely an escape. I believe we have been prompted or given a version of reality that isn't true. And I'm here to teach men that they did not control what happened to them. Now is the time. To some extent, to start a revolution. It is a revolution that empowers us to love ourselves and to raise time to save ourselves. Because that same cycle that you just talked about with your friend and his father said, Men don't cry. That is exactly what's creating the hole in our heart, the darkness in our heart. It's perpetuating these cycles to continue. And if that cycle continues, those numbers of suicide rates you showed me earlier are only going to rise. And I know me saying these words at this point in time feel like a pipe dream. Except nothing ever happened. Except it only happened in movies. But I promise you, this is what humans are meant to experience. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of David's Saturday Night Sit Back. Tonight, sitting across from me, I got Cam Hogan, who is a writer, speaker, and podcaster who is curious about topics such as spirituality, human nature, and personal development. His own podcast is called Question Everything, and he also hosts a men's circle here in Austin, Texas, which is a brotherhood where men can share what's on their minds and hearts in a healthy and safe environment. He also authors The Love Letters, which you can subscribe to through his link tree, which can be found on his Instagram account, at the Cameron Hogan. Cameron's on a mission to help you understand that you are loved, that you are enough, and I can't wait to dig into his past today and learn how he became the man that he is today. Cameron, with all that being said, welcome to your episode of David Saturday Night Sit Back. Thank you so much for having me. We've been wanting to do this for quite a while. Glad we can finally make it happen. We have. We have. Yeah, I wanted to... Uh, I, to be honest, I wanted to wait a few months and just see, sort of see how your life continued to develop, and you had just done a few other shows, and I was like, let's, let's space this out a bit and see what, see what happens if we do it in June. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm very glad you did. Well, hello there, Thad. Uh, I'm very glad you did. Um, a lot has happened in those past few months. I think it's a good call for you. Are you, uh, are you happy? I'm very happy. You hesitated. Yeah, well, you I, I hesitated hesitate. last time, down. too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know... I always oftentimes don't identify with being happy because I think if we make it our identity to be a happy person, when we're not, when life throws pain your way, then it kind of cripples you because what you used to identify as you no longer can. And so when you, you've asked me that before once on a walk, I think it was recently, and I remember I took a large exhale right before. <laughs> and usually that's like the opposite. You're like, oh. I'm happy. That means you're not happy. I, I feel like I actually am happy. I think I have many glimpses of joy and bliss. I, I'd go as far to say that probably a little bit more than the average person in my life. Um, but it's not something I really strive for. You know, I think there are other things w one can strive for, and as a byproduct, they'll feel happy. Yeah, I, I agree to a certain extent. Um, I like to ask people it because it's a – I like to ask people anything other than how are you. Because you get you, you you get such a, it's so easy to accidentally just be like I'm fine, I'm well, I'm good. But if you ask someone if they're happy, they sort of got to check in with themselves for a second, and, and they're like, wait, I don't know, <laughs> maybe they're not. And I've had some people tell me that. I had one guy. Um, I usually try not to curse before ten minutes into the show, but I'll cut it out or something. I had one guy who I asked once. I think it was at the gym, and he said, "That's none of your business." And I was like, "Oh." So, no. Check <laughs> you're, that as a no. You're not, you're not happy. 
<laughs> I've seen him a couple more times too, and part of me wants to like go up to him and be like, "Do you need a vent about anything?" And part of me is just like, "Just leave the guy alone. Just let him work out, do his thing. He's dealing with something. Hopefully, he gets on the other side of it." Let us do his bench press in peace. <laughs> yes, you know. But yeah, it, it's so funny. I think, sadly, there are so many people nowadays that feel that way. They're unhappy. Yeah, and some aren't as free to say directly to your face no i'm not happy whatever it is um but so many i think are hidden and, and they're suffering yeah and i'm um, doing my best to change that do you um have you ever heard that saying that you are the you know butcher this a little bit but like you're the byproduct of the five people you spend the most time with that's so true i was, just, I was gonna ask you do you think there's some truth to that that's so true yeah 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 and i think it matters for all aspects of life you are the byproduct. The amount of money you make is a byproduct of the average of the five people you're around. Your happiness levels, more than likely your your fitness and active activity levels, everything is going to be in accordance to your environment. And I think that makes complete sense to me. Do you feel like you are the sum of the five people you hang around? Um. Hmm. In some ways, yeah. I think there's some truth to it as well. Um. A different lens that I've been putting some things through recently is only spend time spend time doing what you would do if you only had six months to live. Oh. And I didn't want to, I wasn't planning on getting this like introspective so quickly, but there is one person in my life who is very flaky, um, sort of the kind of individual who will make plans with you, and maybe if they're ten days away if something better comes along in those 10 days, he won't even, like, text you to be like, oh, I'm going to go do this thing. He just doesn't show up. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and so I heard – I and, and the thing that's a bummer is I thoroughly enjoy his company when he shows up. But he's pulled this little stunt a few times now. And so now I, I've been sort of reanalyzing, like, all right, that's, let's say I really did have cancer. Let's go with that. And I knew that I was going to die on December 31st of this year. Would I continue to pursue that relationship when I could show up on the walks every Saturday morning where I know there's going to be some amazing people who will show up? And you know what I mean? And, and so I'm like, man, am I, am I about to cut this fool out of my life? I don't know. Because <laughs> the, the other thing is, is, like, do we – do I – Am I lowering my standards of friendship because I think I have thirty years to live? Mm. Oh, I have all this time to waste, so I'm I'm all I'm okay with chasing mediocre friendships. Yeah, well, you don't have that much time to waste. I don't know if you saw that post I made on Instagram a couple weeks ago, but I said there is, you know, 168 hours in a week. If you work a standard 40 hours a week job, if you sleep seven hours a night, you spend an hour in the car, an hour walking the dog. Let's say you were, you're given $164 to spend every week. By the time you take out all those expenses, you only have 29 bucks left. Or for me, mine, by the time I got whittled mine down, is like 15. So I have 15 hours left that I can do whatever I want with. That's not that much money left over. When you start with 168, pay all your bills, you only have 15. So even if I do live 30 years, like in that time, I really only have a few hours on a weekly basis to play with. So why am I casually just like giving it away to people who don't even show up when they gave me their word that they would show up to something. I think that is a fantastic example on how to live life. You know, life is all about the time that we have available and even more importantly that the energy that we have in those moments, right? There are certain people that just retired at age 65 and they may live for another 20, 30 years, but they don't have their health, therefore they don't have energy to do anything. So what's the point of having 20, 30 years left if you don't have the energy to actually live the life you want to live? And so I think energy is incredibly important and it feels as if people that aren't giving you energy are oftentimes taking it away from you. Mm. And so I assume in those moments when that guy doesn't show up, you feel somewhat defeated mm -hmm. and depleted. And so, yeah, man, it makes complete sense if, if someone's treating you that way, you don't want to have them in your life anymore because right. you know there's going to probably be a laundry list of people that are waiting for you to call them to hang out. And they deserve that time with you yeah. to treat you right as opposed to someone who doesn't. So it makes complete sense to me, man. Yeah. Well, anywho, that tangent aside, um, who, knowing sort of what we're going to talk about today, who, uh, who are you speaking to? Who do you hope tunes into this episode? 
not a specific person. I'm not asking you to say like you know name from someone on the walk or anything like that. But like, who do you ima- who do you sort of hope is on the other side of this camera tonight? Well, I know n- two people, L and my mom. So hello. But besides that, the, the person, the archetype that I'd like to watch or listen to this podcast would probably be anyone who's ever identified with being curious. Hmm. My favorite quality in people besides kindness is curiosity. And a lot of my life for this past handful of years to get where I'm at has come from endless curiosity and asking questions about everything and everyone. And thankfully, over time, it leads to some answers. And then when you embrace and embody those answers, oftentimes you get the life you want. That life maybe look a lot different from others, but it's a life worth pursuing. And so I would say the right group of people, the people who I'm trying to reach through this podcast, will be anyone who is curious or anyone who is seeking. Okay, cool. Give us um, one piece of context. If you had to pick out one thing from all your time that you've been alive that would help us understand who you are today, what would that piece of context be? That piece of context would be, I think, a period of my life where I had everything I could have ever imagined. Right? I was working in a high-income job. I had um, dating girlfriends, mm-hmm. <laughs> plural, <laughs> sadly. Um, I was, I had my dream car, had my dream apartment, was always, this was in college, partying, was having a great time, but I felt absolutely miserable. And so what I did was I did something very sporadic and I sold everything, quit everything and booked a lonely ticket to go to Bali. And in doing so with my endless drive for curiosity, it brought me on a path that I can now live a life that I truly love and can make my own rules. And thankfully, in doing so, everything else just kind of takes care of itself. The wants and needs that come with life just happen. And so that turning point in my life of taking that leap, taking that risk, has led to so many fantastic results in a life that I love. That experience, that time window, would be the context I give others. Gotcha. Let's go back really far. Let's do it. Where were you born? I was born in Las Vegas, Nevada. Really? Yep. Born and raised. How long were you? did you stay there for? I was born and raised in the exact same house in Las Vegas, Nevada, until I was 18, because I went off to college, and then I went to Northern Nevada, which we Reno. What was it like growing up in Vegas? It was weird, <laughs> man. I went back there last week for the first time in quite a while, so I moved to Austin, and it's a unique place. Like, if you think about how the average, the average household, the average community, they want their children to grow up to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, there's kind of this normal structure that they want everyone to to live out. In Vegas, a lot of the <coughs> money is made through casinos, mm-hmm. through gambling. So I knew a lot of people whose friends' parents were poker dealers, were cocktail waitresses, were strippers. I was around people that were drug dealers at a very high level. And that type of job, that type of you know, just occupation as a whole, that lifestyle as a whole, is kind of normal there. And so I didn't know anything different because that's all I knew. But once I removed myself from that environment, living in other places, I realized, oh, that's not normal. Hmm. So like in Vegas, they have no emphasis on education. We have one of the worst school districts in the entire country because you don't need a four-year degree or you don't need to you know, go to law school, whatever it is, to just be a poker dealer. Right. The economy itself is ins- incentivized for that. And so that dramatically changes human behavior and how parents teach their kids. And so I started to realize that over time, and I realized, like, I love this place. I'm so grateful for this place, but this isn't where I want to be going forward. Um, so it was this incredible experience where I, I was able to see, you know, a lot of people doing very well financially and other aspects of life and also the complete opposite of that. And I've been able to kind of pick and choose what exactly – I want to have in my life going forward. So it was an incredible experience. And I still have my parents back there. Most of my family is still there. I visit often. And it's just a blast from the past every time I go back. But it was definitely unique, to say the least. What did your parents do? My parents were a little bit different. So my mother, while I was growing up, was a dentist. Okay. She owned her own practice and did that for 20 years. Um, and my father, and still to this day, is a chiropractor. 
And so they were definitely unique in the um, community where they both were doctors and they both were, were paid relatively well, which gave me a very different life than a lot of my classmates. Um, but yeah, I'm very fortunate. You know, they were able to also show me what the average person was like. A lot of their patients and clients were, you know, blue collar um, workers, oftentimes Hispanic or whatever it may be, who spoke very little English, who doesn't have that many skills to build wealth or to ascend um, on different levels of the income scale, whatever it may be. And so my parents were able to kind of show me another side to life through the people that work with every single day. And it was just this incredible experience to learn about all different cultures and all different backgrounds and to have love for each and every one of them. Did you ever have a, a like a realization that like your family was a little bit, I don't want to say different, but that there is more money in your, did you, was, Most definitely. was there an eye opening moment or was it just sort of like, you just sort of always realized it. I remember I had this one moment when I was playing middle school basketball, and I had one friend who I didn't know this, but pretty much was growing up in a foster home. And I've had a very unpredictable childhood. And I remember one day he came to practice bragging about this little kind of box of snacks that he had at home. He's like, bro, my place now, I got Doritos, I got Pringles, I got... Oreos, I got these Gatorades, and I'm like, okay, like it's not that big of a deal. But to him, that was everything. Hmm. Hit that w was something worth bragging about to him. That wasn't just something common that would be in his pantry or fridge every week. This was something that he cherished because it wasn't really natural to him. And that was a really eye-opening moment for me. Thankfully, a lot of the friends that I made um, all throughout, especially middle school, but elementary school and high school, were from very different socioeconomic backgrounds. So I was able to kind of dip my toe into that um, into that way of life. And I realized they're also just incredible people. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. They're very hardworking. They're incredibly kind. They're intelligent. There's all these different things, all these different attributes that myself and my parents also are. And so thankfully, it was able to allow myself to have a lot of respect for them and admiration for that type of lifestyle. And, you know, one thing that was definitely very odd, though, was my parents as a whole, being a chiropractor and dentist, they're very much into nutrition. And so I realized, like, growing up, I was in, put in an environment where I only ate healthy food. The far majority of my meals were chicken, rice, and broccoli. Hmm. And there were times in my life where I'd have, um, like, pretty much like a senior citizen. They have, like, those pill cabinets or the little things that every single day of the week. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I used to, you know, have 20, sometimes 40 different vitamins to take on a daily basis. My parents were absolute health freaks. And at that time, I was like, what is wrong with you guys? <laughs> like, all my friends are having pizza for lunch and, you know, PB&J, whatever it is. You're popping vitamins. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, popping, popping, yeah. Multivitamins. <laughs> green drinks in the morning. Like, what is going on? You guys but needed some athletic greens in that house. E exactly. save you some time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, it was a unique learning experience to realize that not everyone um, values their health and that although the time I, I looked at my parents kind of sideways, like, what are we doing now? I am incredibly grateful for them being okay, being different, and choosing a very healthy route because I feel like it's it's benefited me greatly, you know, a decade plus later. And so I, I grew up in a very unique household, you know, um, somewhat well off around people that were relatively poor and then extremely healthy yeah. around a group of people that were relatively sick. And so I was able to kind of see both perspectives because I was living in one and then viewing the other constantly every single day. So overall, I was just incredibly grateful on top of that living in Las Vegas with the amount of um, experiences I got throughout my first 18 years. Was there ever a time that you were, like, involved in a drug deal and didn't know what was going down, and then 10 years later you were like, huh, I Let was a part of quite a few of those. Let's just say I went <laughs> to a few sleepovers where random people would show up at the door, and then someone would go in a back room to grab something and then exchange it with them for some cash. <laughs> like, it was no any blatant <laughs> drug deal. Right. But at, you know, what would have been 14, 15 years old, I knew what was going on. Um, and that's okay. You know, as long as I was not in harm's way, I didn't really care. Yeah. Um, but in, in Vegas, honestly, it's a lot more loose than probably any other major city. It's so much more of the norm. So, um, but yeah, n no blatant drug deal, thankfully. And I was never the one doing it, of course. Uh, well, of course. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was listening to a, a podcast the other day, and the host, who is sober now, was talking about how 
one of the low points of his life was when he bought drugs at a one-year-old's birthday party. <laughs> it, was, it was my proudest is this, moment. Is this Theo Vaughn? Who is this? Yeah. Of course it is. Of course it is. How would you guess that? You don't have that type of mullet <laughs> and then not buy drugs for a one-year-old's birthday party. <laughs> so as soon as you s- said the sleepover, it's immediately where my head went. It's like, maybe Theo was there. That's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, he's like exchanging a bag of diapers for the the weed or something, the, the cocaine, whatever he's buying. Like that, that's wild. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, did you ever get into any kind of trouble or mischievous uh, habit habits or activities, or did you keep it on the pretty relatively straight and narrow? I was a good kid. I was definitely pretty straight and narrow. I had you know friends that would you know shoplift every once in a while and do things like that. But thankfully, myself, I never really wanted to. They oftentimes, would gift me the things that they shoplifted. So I guess secondhand crime, but um, yeah, nothing, nothing in particular. I didn't smoke weed or, or drink at all in high school. Hmm. Only started that in college. Um, so yeah, definitely straight arrow. To be honest with you, I was definitely afraid of disappointing my parents. You know, I was very grateful because I saw the life they were giving me, um, opposed to many of the other classmates that I had. And I'm like, I don't want to do anything to mess this up. You know, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I have things really well, and so um, mostly out of fear, but I, I stayed away from a lot of that growing up. But so not a fear of, of them per se, but just a fear of losing the lifestyle that exactly. you had. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's like you're so grateful for something, why do anything to jeopardize it? Right. So. Um, here's a bit of irony for you. I didn't have a lot of money when I was younger, and um, my parents raised us pretty Christian, and I would steal Christian like worship CDs from the store and then like go home and do like my Bible studies to them with the music Holy. that I just stole. That's the most holy <laughs> theft I've ever heard in my entire life. I have to go home and be like praying for forgiveness, but oh, be like, I really want to listen to this music while I read the Bible today. As a good kid. So you're praying for forgiveness as the thing you stole was playing, in the, playing background. in the background. I love it. I love it, man. And well, if you're gonna steal, might as well might do as well it. Steal that. Christian stuff, so Bibles, in, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. literally. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, Whew. um, thought you might enjoy that. I love it. Do you have a? Do you have any siblings? I don't know a child. Really? Yeah. Do you? Uh, do you know why your parents didn't have any more other kids other than just yourself? I think they definitely tried, you know. Um, but oftentimes life has different plans, and so none of that really worked for them. And thankfully, growing up as only child, didn't have to share anything. <laughs> I was a spoiled kid, to be honest with you. Um, they really enjoyed the one kid they had, and so I'm grateful that that was able to happen. I oftentimes wonder what life would have been with siblings, but I guess we'll never find out. I was going to say, you, you have no way of, of knowing, because yeah. I have four siblings, and I, it's like, how would I, I have turned out if they weren't there? Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, and it, w- it, 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 and it, it definitely wasn't always perfect. There definitely was, mo- like, the sharing thing. Yeah. You know, it would have been really nice sometimes to be like, oh, I just give all this stuff to myself. Yeah. That's sort of cool. Maybe I would have had the money to buy those CDs. <laughs> Didn't have to steal them <laughs> right. in the name of Christ. <laughs> if I was an only child, there wouldn't have been as many allowances to go around. I love it. Um, yeah, who, who knows? Who knows? Do you see, not to put a spotlight on your inadequacies, but do you see, like, only childness showing up in your adult life? Do you ever catch you doing something where you're like, come on, Cam. I'm definitely You're better very, than this. I'm very weird. <laughs> so am I. I've, We're all weird. I've... I've never met an only child that feels perfectly normal, <coughs> and I, I'm very much odd. I feel as if um, I struggle first to share things, whether it's with my girlfriend or just um, team members, whatever it may be. Um, my first impulse is, oh, all this is mine. And I need to kind of think, oh, no, nope, no, nope. let other people have slices of the cake, or <laughs> or with literally or metaphorically there. And, uh, yeah, I noticed that come out a little bit. But thankfully, you know, one thing being a child that I don't think a lot of people's siblings understand is that when you're growing up and it's time for, you know, the parents to go out to dinner, mm-hmm. oftentimes, when you have a lot of siblings, oftentimes just leave all the siblings at home and the oldest one's in charge. Right. But when you're only a child, oftentimes your parents just bring you with them to other, you know, occasions with their adult friends or whatever it may be. And so oftentimes you grow up incredibly quick because you're being exposed to more adult conversations. And so I think growing up, I would say thankfully, because I'm very happy with, with how my life is now, um, I grew up pretty fast. I was able to communicate with adults very well. I still do, still do to this day. And, um, yeah, just I think it makes you a lot wiser. 
when when you see 40 and 50 year olds all the time yeah. as opposed to just other eight year olds totally and so overall man i'm very happy being a child and thankfully you know even though i don't have siblings mm-hmm. i have some um, cousins my my aunt who grew up on the side of town has seven kids um ranging from now 32 to 18 and i'm kind of right in the middle at 24 and so i had a, a good measure of pretty much brothers from another mother and, and sisters from another mother so thank you i was able to i think kind of have the best of both worlds that's cool that's good did you feel more comfortable around adults than you did kids your age when yeah, you were growing up? Yeah, always have. How about now, today? Still do. Huh. I still feel more comfortable around 40 and 50-year-olds than I do 20-year-olds. Um, I don't feel like I fit in at all. Why not? I've always very much been an old soul. And when I've decided to do the things that a 20-year-old would like, whether it's drinking and partying or it's simply just what they like to wear or how they spend their free time, I've never really related to that. I've always related to the people that are much older than me. I've been called old man and grandpa my entire life, not just because I go to bed at like 9 o'clock, whatever it is, but just just in general. And um, I always felt like when I was doing the things a 20-year-old or or someone just my age was doing, I was doing it more out of guilt that I need to fit in Hmm. as opposed to doing what I actually want to do. I've always been mature, maybe oftentimes maybe to a fault, because it would be hard for me just to kind of like play house around, you know, with, with my basketball teammates, whatever it is. I was just, I was very, not saying serious, but more um, put together for someone in their teens or 20s. And uh, I think there's pros and cons to that. But I'm, I'm very happy that now that I feel like I can express myself in any way unapologetically, even if that resembles the habits of a 65-year-old man, mm. you know. When we guys might reference a walk a few times on this podcast tonight, and what we're referring to is out here in Austin, there's something, is it called the boardwalk? Yep. Okay, there's something called the boardwalk where probably anywhere from like 40 to 90 people, a, a relatively large group, get together, 8 a.m. Saturday morning, we go for a five-mile walk, it lasts about two and a half hours, um, and the main idea of the walk is that you have interesting conversations and you sort of flow in and out from multiple people, so you're not just talking with one or two other people the entire walk. Um, so if we're referencing the walk or the boardwalk, there's some context for you. That being said, on the walks, do you find yourself gravitating to people older than you, or do you try to almost like practice talking to people your age to build up that skill set of being able to relate to anyone? To be honest with you, man, there's not been one time on the walks where I felt like I intentionally went up to someone. Every single walk I go on, I just walk, and then someone comes up to me. And so that's just how it's always been. You've never approached someone. No. There's I've never been someone where you're like, that topic is badass. I want to go talk to David about whatever n- it was. Never, never. I've floated away from people, but then <laughs> I just kind of, I've walked away, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I've never floated to someone. I, after I float away, I just kind of sit there by myself or walk there by myself. And oftentimes that's just for a few seconds, but sometimes that's an entire mile. And then I just wait for the next person to come up. And naturally, I think the right conversation will, will sprout from that. And honestly, it's just kind of how I live my life. But, yeah, th- that's what I do in the walks. Hmm. W- I do find myself, we, we walk alone together every now and then if someone floats away. I don't feel a need to immediately go find the next group to, to jump into. And sometimes I just enjoy being out there with the dog. And I'll, I do what you do. And I'll, I'll see who maybe comes up to me, whether it was because of my topic or just because they see I'm alone or whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter, you know? Um, But yeah, the, the walk, it's a, it's a real magical thing because it does sort of have a natural way of just sort of flowing. And I've floated away from a few uh, conversations as well. Not that many, most of the the ones I've thoroughly enjoyed so far. Um, But yeah, there's a very natural flow to that walk. Most definitely. It's epic. And I think the more or less you think and the more you feel into what's best for that walk, that will lead to the best results. Yeah. I think that's kind of what it's all about, yeah. actually. And so, yeah, just taking that to heart. And I've really enjoyed that experience, you know. Um, I've had to go out of town, whether it's for you know, family events or, or work in the past handful of months, and I really miss those Saturdays when I'm gone because it now feels like a pillar of my week. Yeah. And where I'm, I'm out there socializing, meeting new people, and just, yeah, I- enjoying life for just, like, the simple conversations that can come from it. You know one thing that I found in – Austin, or maybe it's attributed to the walk, and I don't know if this would have happened back in my 
hometown in Sacramento. But um, I also missed about three walks back to back um, due to traveling, and it, I think all of them I was out of, I was out of town. Um, and I think it was after week two, someone called me from the walk and just wanted to make sure I was okay. Really? You know how good that made me feel. Wow! Just because I missed two weeks in a row, they wanted to. I, I, my cadence was so regular. I, I that I disappeared for two, and he reached out and was like, "You're good, right?" It's like, "Yeah, man, I'm, I'm in California. I'm doing great. I'm seeing my, I'm seeing my mom for Mother's Day." That's exactly what we need. We need community there. We need people to realize when we're gone. Right. Doesn't that feel like so fantastic? It was one of the best feelings of my <laughs> life. I saw him calling, and I was like, I wonder what's up. I was tempted not to pick up because I was with family, but he doesn't call me that often, so I figured let's just see what he wants real quick, and I'll keep the conversation short. And sure enough, he only needed like 30 seconds. He just wanted to make sure I was okay. Just to make sure your heart was still beating. Yeah. Perfect. Like, that's what we're missing. I'm so glad you were able to get that from the walks. Yeah, dude. It was awesome. That's really cool. I'll have to tell Elle that when I see her this Saturday. She's going to love that. Yeah, I'll, I'll make, I forgot to mention it last week, but I'll bring it up. Um, now, how long have you been in Austin? I've been in Austin uh, a few days over five months. A few days over five months. Do you feel like you have formed a circle of friends, or is that still sort of in, in the making? Thankfully, I think I did that nearly immediately. The first month actually living here, I did very little. Stayed in my empty apartment because I own no furniture. And honestly, I was just afraid of the huge transition. I just come from Bali, which every part of life was completely different. And it was hard assimilating back. And I just moved to a city where I'd never been before and didn't know anyone. So the first month was hard. But then right after that, after I started to get out there a little bit more, um, happened to, to meet Elle, thankfully. And not only her, but her friend group. And then the walks. And then naturally, I've been able to just accumulate or attract a group of people also to the men's circle that I really just love to hang out with mm. and like what you talked about earlier when it comes to the five people in our life that kind of a we are the sum of the five people in our life I feel very happy for the first time in my life that the five people close to me are people that I actually want to be and enjoy being around mm. and so I've thankfully been very fortunate ever since moving to Austin where I feel like I don't have any family or friends that I'm only with them because of the past, but that I actually want to be with in this present moment. And that goes for everyone I'm in contact with here. And that just gives me a new lease on life and has yeah. allowed me to just look at life as the incredible, beautiful game that it is. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's been, a, thankfully, a very easy, swift transition as soon as I allow myself to get out of the apartment. As you think about those friends, the ones here in Austin, are they older than you? Most of them. I have a, a good friend that's 19, but the most of them are in the late 20s, early 30s. One of the best friends here, I think, is about mid-40s. And so, as the rest of my life, they're oftentimes older. And I'm okay you're with that. You're staying on brand. Yeah, yeah, they're matching the my maturity level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it, it's not a bad thing or anything. I was just I was curious. Part of the my train of thinking was um, that growing up, I had a really hard time talking with guys. Mm. I had a oh, terrible time making guy friends. I had a lot of lady friends. Um, I had a very easy time talking to girls. Um, I think my sexuality probably played into that. I just got nervous around guys. I never knew what to say to them. If I was in a circle of dudes at school or whatever, I was always silent. I never knew what to say, how to say. I just, I froze up. Yeah. And um, fast forward to today, and I can, I can talk with anyone, but like it's something I had to actively work on that I was very bad at, and now, and it, but with practice, you know. Yeah. It, so, it's so what did change? Do you think just the repetitions? Um, yeah, dude. It's just walking up. Honestly, it was walking up to strangers in the gym and just starting conversations. Awesome. Not long ones, but, like, if I saw a dude struggling on bench and then he added a little bit more weight, I'd just walk up to him and I'd, like, wave at him or poke him on the shoulder if he had headphones in. I'd just be like, hey, man, I know you don't know me, but – if you want a spot so you can put up a few more pounds or a couple extra reps, let me know. And that that tactic in and of itself has led me to some beautiful friendships. Awesome. Yeah. Just don't ask that one guy, are you happy? <laughs> right. yeah, stay away from him, maybe. Yeah, I, that, my, I know exactly who he is. He, I will never forget that face. That is hilarious. Um, That's amazing. I'm just having a bad day. Yeah. But, yeah, dude, even like uh, I think I was telling you on the walk um, – when I was in Chicago, we were at this conference center, and there's a bunch of companies there at once. And I saw this one dude sitting by himself, and maybe it's the podcaster in me, but I just 
one of the things I did when I moved to Austin was I wanted to meet one new person every time I left my house. So I thought, I'm going to go have breakfast with that guy. And I just walked over to him. And I was like, hey, I uh, don't want to bother you. If you wanted to eat alone on purpose, totally get it. But also, may I eat breakfast with you? And he's like, yeah, dude, sit down. We had a great conversation. Of course. Yeah. There are so many great people in this world. <laughs> yeah. That are just like yearning for someone to talk to them. Yeah. And it feels so good to be able to, to meet them halfway and do that. Yeah, it was awesome. That's really cool. Man. Yeah, I hope to see him again one day. I'm not sure if we will. He lives in Long, Long Island. I live here in Austin, but... I pitched Austin pretty hard to him, so we'll see, what, <laughs> we'll see what happens. It's an easy sell. Yeah, he's in college right now, so maybe right after he graduates, he'll be like, oh, let's go out to Texas for a little <laughs> bit, <laughs> shoot some boars. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. That's what we're known for here, apparently. Um, going back to when you were growing up, what was, your, uh, what was your, your high school experience like? Anything that we haven't really talked about yet? Thankfully, it was really good. You yeah. know, um, to, not, to put in this way, I know how it sounds, but I was definitely the popular kid. You know, I, I had a group of friends, large group of friends. And even though at that time was probably when I most felt misunderstood by people my age, I was able to easily kind of mold myself in the person that they wanted me to be. And so in doing so, that's what it takes to be popular. And so thankfully, I had a lot of um, friends at that time. I was on multiple sports teams, team captain, a few of them. I was in student council, student body treasurer, like the whole nine on that end. And um, it was honestly just a really enjoyable experience. And I look back. Um, despite me not being the fullest version of myself I would have liked to have been, right. or fully authentic in that way, as a whole, I'm very grateful with how things ended up. Like, it all went really well. And um, yeah, things just, just went my way, thankfully. Did you ever find yourself doing something that you didn't want to do to fit that mold? Even if it wasn't a bad thing. Like, did you ever find yourself playing s football and you're like, man, why the fuck am I doing this for everyone else? I don't, you know what I mean? Do, was there ever anything that you, out of character, that you saw yourself it, doing? It was oftentimes. Um, just hanging out with a certain group of people that later on I'm like, why am I actually hanging out with them? Because like they have the status at school or because they're actually good people. And I realized, especially the younger years of high school, that I was doing it simply because of the status that came along with hanging out with football players or cheerleaders, whatever it was, but they, they weren't actually enjoyable. And the people on the other side of the cafeteria were the ones laughing and having a great time. Hmm. And I want to be over there with them. And so thankfully, as my high school experience went on, I decided to transition to the other side and actually enjoy the people I was around. But to begin with, yeah, I think I, I felt the need as a very insecure young guy that I needed to look a certain way, be a certain way, and um, only associate with a certain type of person. And then, of course, as we go, I realize that's all just bullshit. Right. <laughs> like, like, hang out with who you want to hang out with. Um, but at the time, I didn't know that. And so that's, I think, one thing that I, I did. Thankfully, it wasn't like drugs or it wasn't, you know, on a football team, whatever right, it is. Right, like I said, it could have been a, a quote, an objectively good thing. Like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm simply doing this sport for popularity or I, I'm mm -hmm. in theater because of I'm trying to get with this girl or, like, whatever it is, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thankfully, no huge after school activities like that. But actually, now that you mention it, I think I did not want to be a part of student council at all. But I did it for <laughs> four years total just because it's like a unique click of people that you're kind of guaranteed to have friends you spend so much time with them in school and out of school yeah but honestly didn't really enjoy it that much like at all so i never thought of that before i appreciate you bringing this to my attention man <laughs> you're welcome wow <laughs> i gotta reflect on that a little bit while Later. you were doing student council i was doing cocaine <laughs> 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 i'm kidding <laughs> This is the Theo Vaughn <laughs> podcast <laughs> this past weekend. Oh, I'm so happy I can make you laugh, Lil. I love, oh, I love seeing people laugh. That was That's great. That's hilarious. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> That's such a Theo Vaughn thing to say. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, no, I, I ran for student council. And dude, I, I ran, I think it was my eighth grade year. So I was running for a, a position I would have got as a freshman. And I was going to this really small private school. And so to win everyone over... Um, or to try to win votes anyways, I made, like, a hundred cupcakes and, like, homemade frosting. We didn't buy that jarred stuff. We made it ourselves in the Eau Claire nice. home. Sprinkles, put, like, vote for David flags in them or something. I forget. Um, and I went out to, went to school the next day and was carrying, like, these four boxes of cupcakes posted up next to the lockers, gave one to everyone, and I thought for sure I had it in the bag, whatever position I was running for. Um, and dude, the, the popular kids got it every year. Of it course. was the same group of 
however many it was, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 officers. Um, and it was like 95% the same people every year. It's so rigged. Of course. And it's funny how the people even voting feel like they need to vote for them. Yeah. You know? Like, I assume the popular people weren't the masses at the school. But for some reason, the masses still felt as if they need to vote for a certain type of person because that inserts their chances of being popular or being liked by them, whatever it was. So yeah. I assume your cupcake, cupcakes were good enough to sway that vote, but they just felt as if they needed to still vote the popular guys. Yeah, no, they, 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 I, I don't think the cupcakes were good enough. Maybe if I put like some, <laughs> maybe put some cocaine in them. Like you said. I was thinking weed, but, yeah. <laughs> but cocaine too. What is it? Wh- what does, Here's an ignorant question. This shows how little drugs I've done in my life. What effect does cocaine have on you? I like, no what, would, what? I wonder what would happen if a hundred eighth graders were all coked out. Like, what would that campus have? Like, would we all have been sleeping? Would we have been super jittery and energetic? I, I would imagine, <laughs> like, imagine them all just pounding like Monster Energy drinks and Red Bulls, back to back to back. That's what I think it is. And but it's like more jittery, probably like more chomping their teeth, like and that's it. Um, it's funny because I said what does cocaine do to you? And the very first thing that comes up is a number for a helpline. <laughs> 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 um why does it all right, here we go. It makes you feel happy, excited, wide awake, confident on top of your game. Increases your body temperature, your heartbeat faster. You won't feel hungry. You might feel sick. Um, you might need to poop. Uh, could also make you anxious, panicky, and paranoid. <laughs> this would have been a very bad thing it's for all eighth these graders eighth graders <laughs> to be pooping and panicking. Stick with weed. Spike it with weed. <laughs> Tiny, Don't take cocaine. Tiny teens listening. There's also probably like a part of the audience that just clicked off, and they're like, why do these grown men not know what effects cocaine has on the human body? But ignorance is bliss. Because we listen to Jesus Christ CDs. <laughs> the stolen contraband. Stolen contraband <laughs> yeah, instead CDs. of doing cocaine. My God. All right, so student council was your thing that you didn't, that you didn't in hindsight, may have not wanted to do. Um. Did I already ask you if religion played a part in your home at all? Yeah, but Did religion play a part in your home at all? Uh, not really. You know, I think my parents both believe in God and operated life as if they did. They had, inc- like, incredible morals and principles still to this day, like something I really deeply admire. Um, they both went to Catholic school growing up or Catholic church, um, but we never really went as I was growing up. Um, but thankfully, they were able to just kind of, like I said, establish those morals and principles into me without the need for me to understand deeply what that God may look like. Um, so most of my life, I, was, I would say agnostic. Like I was open okay. to something out there, but wasn't really familiar with anything. And then, yeah, in Bali, completely changed my life. And now um, I think I have a deep personal connection with God or the universe. I think they're one and the same. And uh, it doesn't really fall under necessarily any type of religion. Right. But um, it's incredibly strong. It is the thing I care about, the thing I write about, the thing I talk about the most. Before we get into your college days and sort of the transformation uh, that you've gone through in the last couple of years, what was like one of the craziest things you saw in uh, in Reno? Reno oh right? man, yeah, yeah, Reno. So Reno is or pretty Vegas. Sorry, in Vegas. Well, I, I or grew Reno. Either way, born and raised in, in Vegas, but then so I went to high school there. But then I went to college in Reno, and I would say in total, one of the craziest things I've ever seen, while growing up happened to be in Reno and that was I think my very first full day so the morning after my parents dropped me off for college I was running downtown downtown Reno and I saw a homeless man probably five feet away from me like trying to jog with me but on his leg that's facing me imagine a machete that is hooked onto his belt and goes down to, like, his kneecap. And so this homeless crackhead dude, which is kind of just part of the scenery in downtown Reno, had this long-ass machete. And let's just say I started to run a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> I ran straight back to my dorm like a quick u like, oh, All right, welcome to college. Um, so that was one of the, uh, the craziest things I saw, I, I guess, first day. Besides that, just a lot of partying, a lot of – 
a lot of drunk people, a lot of crazy stuff that happens and people are drunk, you know, falling yeah. off balconies or oh, no. you know, landing face first, whatever it is. But thankfully, no one died. No one got seriously injured. But um, just like stuff like that that happens at you know, outrageous college parties. Yeah. But um, yeah, the machete thing definitely gave me a, a unique perspective on the life in Reno first day out there. That's awesome. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. You yeah. didn't talk to him? I did not, no. I had the headphones been in. an interesting guy. I, I think so. I think you should have him on the podcast if you'd like. Well, I, I, have be, I bet he's still in that streets down there. <laughs> I have thought about getting a set of just those like little lapel mics that can sync up to your phone. So if I'm ever out and about and I want to do an impromptu episode, I have a way to record us. That would be incredible. Because like that guy, I don't know if I want to give him my home address, <laughs> but I talk with him on the street in public with lots of witnesses. I <laughs> think that'll make for a very interesting podcast. I'll yeah. tune in. I'll tell you that. That's awesome. D- thank you. I'm sure a few people would probably tune in, hopefully, with Machete Man. Um, did you go to college as soon as you graduated? Or yeah. How did you decide on University of Reno? So in Nevada, just like most states, they highly incentivize you to go to the in-state schools. And so I was a good student. I wasn't by any means like a fantastic student in high school, but I was a good student and received – a handful of scholarships that paid for the far majority of my, my tuition, which made it very cheap in-state as opposed to out-of-state. I was probably paying a fifth, if not a tenth, of the price that I would have if I would have went to somewhere in California, something like that. And so thankfully, it was just the no-brainer option for me. And then growing up at my age, it's just kind of the thing you do. You know, Some people take a year off to travel, but for some reason, it just kind of felt right to just go straight into college. And at that time, I was all about money and finance and economics that's what I studied Mm -hmm. and so yeah I did that for four years but it was just a no-brainer decision it was either go to Reno or stay home in in Vegas that's not something I wanted to do yeah why and did you go the finance route because you wanted the type of job that you had for a while before going to Bali exactly I wanted to make money what was that job period um I was selling financial products and so pretty much was a um I wasn't technically a financial advisor but I was an insurance agent and, s- and I sold other type of varying financial products. It was just as entertaining as it sounds. Incredibly boring. And I realized <laughs> at, you know, 22, like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I've been doing it for a handful of years. But I'm like, if I, I remember the one key experience I had was I was brought down to this event that celebrates the top sales performers of the company. It was actually in Vegas, funnily enough. And I was sitting around a bunch of people that owned part of the company and also owned other insurance companies. And they were all 40s, 50s, all probably worth tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions. And they sat me down on the table and they said, Cameron, if you keep on track to what you're doing, you'll one day be in our shoes. And they said that with a smile on their face. But as soon as they said that, I was straight out of that like TV show scared straight. Hmm. When they take people to jail, like, I felt as if it was somewhat of a death sentence of my soul because these people within themselves made money their God. And hmm. so they had let go of their health. A lot of them were severely obese. They let go of their family. They're most of them on their third wife, and their kids don't talk to them. And money was their only reason for being. Um, and I saw that potentially happening in my own life if I went down that road. And it simply just wasn't path that I wanted to take and I'm so so glad I had that experience of that kind of wake-up call the very next day that's when I went in and told my boss and um, told the team like I'm done I'm done yeah and then the next day is when I booked my way to take it to Bali I graduated from college two weeks later and then off I went you do bring up I've met a few people not many f- 10 to 15 let's say who have a lot of money and they are some of the most miserable people I've ever met. Why do you think that is? Um, probably for the – well, I, the thing is I don't have a lot of insight into their personal life. So I can't speak to their families, like what you were sort of mentioning, uh, whether it's divorce, kids that are estranged or whatnot. Most of them are very overweight, so they don't, they're not taking care of themselves, probably because they're working so much that they don't – have time or make the time to eat healthy, to move their body. Um, but it's just a curious thing I've observed that the few people I've met who are like millionaires or close to, like, God damn, you are so sad. 
Yeah. Not not a judgment of me. That sounded like I was saying they're pathetic. That's not what I meant. It was more like they. Uh, my heart goes out to them. Like yeah. they seem like they are genuinely just sad, depressed, angry, anxious people. It feels like they've been climbing the wrong mountain their entire life, and they got to the top, and they realized they're on the wrong mountain. Right. And yeah, man, it's it's so sad when you see that happening. But to be honest, that is what our society has told us we need to be. It's always about accumulating more and more and more at any cost. The sad thing is, oftentimes, especially amongst rich people, ones that are miserable, they did it out of fear. Like, I need to be worth millions. I need to make that extra 10 million. I need to make that extra 100 million because X, Y, Z, whatever it was. It came from fear. It came from need. Mm -hmm. They weren't attracting that money. They were ruthlessly chasing that money at any cost. So they spent all day, most of their lifetime, chasing a dollar. And in doing so, they gave up everything else. They right. gave up their health, their family, whatever it was. And that's not a price I'm ever going to pay. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I've i said it on this podcast, maybe not through this exact lens, but I haven't spoken to my dad in over a decade at this point. And when people say why, I'm just like, he's too in love with his money. Really? Yeah. Why do you think that is? I think his dad was probably like that. Why do you think that is? <laughs> You're turning into me. This is how I, I just yeah. keep asking why. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I used to think he was – he had to learn it from somewhere. Yeah. Everyone does. Like, you, you know, I – and so I, I have grown – more empathetic for him knowing that like what if he was just modeling the thing that he always observed and he didn't know how to do things any better or different um why do i think he is in love with money maybe i don't think he's very good with people to be honest i don't think he knew how to connect with me mm. and he, the wedge that he drove between us two was that he was a perfectionist so every, you know, nothing was, was good enough, but to an extreme level. He would find the, 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 like, you could do something damn near perfect, or maybe it was perfect. He could find a flaw in it. So it just got exhausting. It just got to a point where I was like, I'm done being here in perfect, son. Why See do ya. you think <laughs> he needed his world to be perfect? Uh, image. I think he really cared what the people at our church thought about him. I think he wanted to have this, like, perfect family, perfect life. And then behind closed doors, it was something completely different mm. than the facade that we put on Sunday mornings. It's funny how that usually works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. Why do you think he needed the people at church to, to think he's perfect? I guess it could have been for the same reason that, like, you were hanging out with people where, in hindsight, you're like, why, why choose them? Except may, I don't know if he ever had the realization. Most people don't. I think he's he's still just... I, I don't think he's had the realization of, like, why am I doing this? You're asking hard questions. I've never thought about these before, about why, why my father is the way he is. Because I don't think I have that love for money. Yeah. It doesn't do... Like, sh I love getting paid. I'm very grateful for my job. But um, I, I truly don't, like, I can't, when we were talking about, like, the, and I'm not trying to divert from my dad, but when we were talking about, like, the people that I brought up who are miserable and also very rich, like, I don't know, maybe it's because I see how miserable they are. I'm like, I almost don't want to be a millionaire. Mm. I think I'm good just making what I make, you know? I'm very yeah. content. Um, I think more money will come uh, as a result of a few things, but even those things I'm doing, like the podcast, I did not start this to make money. It will make money one day. We will have sponsors. M income will come in. And that that'll be great. But I did not start this thing to be like, oh, I'm going to be Rogan one day and make millions of dollars, be a millionaire, have a boat, have a mansion, you know, have yeah. an underground bunker. Like, I don't give a fuck about any of that. Yeah. So do you think you associate a lot of money? with someone who's miserable and did out of fear? Not always, because then you have people, like I'm going to name drop someone we were talking about 
I've never met him, but like Ed Milet, for example, I hope he is the guy on his podcast that he is in the rest of his life. Not to put him on a pedestal and say I think he's perfect or anything, but like I do not think that all rich people are also miserable. You, you know, I think that there are some people who are probably rich and very happy because they probably didn't do it for the wealth. I could be wrong. Like, you know, like I said with myself, I'm not doing this for the wealth. The, the wealth comes. Hopefully it won't corrupt me, and I will stay genuine to who I know that I am. What was your question? Do I associate money with? With being miserable or fear? Um, Not on everyone. I try not to make any kind of generalizations like that on if A, then B must be true. I love that. Yeah, and the person you're talking about, Ed Milet, um, I happen to have a, a friend that is his friend, so I guess a mutual friend. and knows him very well. Grew up with him. Um, you're spot on. I think he's been able to build wealth and make an impact with the goal being an impact. And as a byproduct, he's become incredibly wealthy from that. The person started out with helping families in a very similar industry I was with um, financial products, which is what he has grown and become the chairman of. But now he spends all his free time doing a podcast, writing books, impacting people, literally donate hundreds of millions of dollars. And you can just see the love radiating from mm. him. Am I saying he's a person without any fear or anxieties? or anything? No, of course not. But I am saying that he's leading from love. Yeah, And I'd love to see that. That's and like, awesome. I want people like that to have a lot of money because they'll do something great with it. Yeah. And so, yeah, like, like you were saying, I think it's definitely possible that money is not associated with someone being miserable and, um, you know, fear. I think there are people out there and more and more every single day that are making it from a place of love and impact. And um, that's something I think beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty dang cool. Well, that's cool about Ed. Yeah. Because I have no association with him at all. So I was, as soon as I started saying, I'm like, this guy could be an asshole in real life. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I know nothing about the dude past yeah. his podcast. But that's cool that he's, uh, th th that you have that insider information. Good yeah, job, Ed. Keep it up. Yeah, keep it up, Ed. You're probably watching this podcast. <laughs> We're <now>. grateful. <laughs> You're probably watching, yeah, yeah. DS and SP is his favorite podcast. <laughs> um, someone's watching it. I don't know who they are. How did college impact you? College was a unique mirror to my life, I'd say. You know, college, I was in there, you know, I'm only 24, so COVID happened right in the middle. So I had a unique experience where um, halfway through my sophomore year, the world shut down. And for the next year and a half, I was doing college, which was supposed to be my golden years online. And um, to be honest with you, it was a big time in my life where I was able to get a lot of alone time. I was in my dorm room by myself for months on end, which came with its definite negatives. But the positives were I got to realize, like, oh, I don't actually want to be here. I don't actually want to be doing this. I want to be hanging out with these people. And so it served as a great mirror of, like, oh, a lot of my life so far has been doing things because this is what expected. This is what is expected of me at this age. But then I realized, like, all those are just stories I don't have to listen to. And so I realized, like, everything I was doing wasn't for me. It was for someone else. And it's now time to change that. And so thankfully, I'm incredibly grateful for my college experience, despite COVID happening in the middle of it, because it was such a turning point in my life of after college, I can either go on one track and put my head down and have all the certain accolades in the next 10, 20, 30 years, or I can put it all on, on black or red and risk it and, and take risk in life and, and not know what the next year of my life is going to look like and take that path and see where it, it goes and trusting that everything that I want to need will be taken care of. And so college was definitely, I think, if anything, a huge mirror for who it was at the time. And more importantly, a great time for me to kind of play around with who I want to be in the future. We have no way of telling the future, but if you had to guess, if you had to speculate, let's say COVID hadn't happened, where do you think you'd be in life right now? Oh, sadly, I think COVID was a huge wake-up call for me. And so if I if a COVID event or something like it didn't happen, I would probably be still selling financial products, living in either yeah, probably Las Vegas or Reno, um, making good money, mm -hmm. but not loving my life. At that time when I was doing those um, that business and was in school, I had to drink myself to sleep every single night. Hmm. I had to smoke weed most nights and play video games to forget the day because it was so unaligned with what I was doing. And so I'd like to think that I'd be on the same path that I am now, but I probably wouldn't be. 
I'd, I'd be on the more stereotypical path, the one that we get a, a larger pat on the back from society. And so, of course, I wish COVID did not happen. It was a terrible thing for the world. But um, for me personally, I'm so grateful for it. Yeah. You were, so you were drinking or smoking yourself to sleep because you knew something was off. Exactly. But you couldn't necessarily put your finger on it. Exactly. So ever since I was younger, I'd say about 17, I've had a very strong voice in my head and throughout my body. It tells me exactly what to do in every moment. It tells me exactly what to say, how to be. And for the majority of my life, especially around, um, you know, end of high school and college, I was doing the opposite of what the voice wanted me to do because I was doing what everyone else is doing. I was, you know, going to school for stuff I didn't really care about. I was drinking. I was smoking. I was just hanging around people that just didn't make any sense. I was, there's so many things that s- felt so misaligned that the voice internally was telling me not to do, but I kept on doing it anyways. And that caused a lot of friction in my life. And so I did my best to numb that voice with certain substances. And then I realized over time, like, what if I just listened to it? And that's when I moved to Bali. That's when I went on incredible experiences in Bali. And I'm now where I'm at today here in Austin, Texas. I've just been following that voice. And thankfully, when you follow that voice, at least in my opinion, through the voice I have, life begins to happen for me instead of to me. And life feels a lot easier, feels faster. And it also just feels more blissful and joyful. And so I, I believe this voice is something everyone has. I just I grew up very intuitive, which what I believe it is, my intuition, that has really just navigated me through these past six years of my life as I've balanced listening to it and kind of um, fighting against it. And then I'm finally just on the right track where everything it says I'm, I'm going to listen to. So it's always steered me in the right direction. So um, that's a unique, I would say, gift that I have. But I think all of us may have if we want to be in tune with it. But it has something that served me incredibly well uh, and I'm very grateful for it. There is a, a book that like 50% of the people are going to click off as soon as I say this because I bring it up so much, but it's called The Gift of Fear. Have you ever heard of it? No. Do you read much or Audible, either yeah, one? Yeah. You should, uh, do you like um, nonfiction, personal development type books? That's, that's my type. So my, how do I want to pitch this to you? Imagine if a wolf is walking up to a steel box and inside of the steel box with no windows, only one entrance in and out, um, it's soundproof, and it senses that the wolf that's already inside the steel box could pose danger to him. Do you think he's going to get in the box with the, the other wolf? No, why would he? What did you say, no, and then what? Why would he? Right. Why would a woman get into an elevator with a man that she doesn't feel safe around? That makes complete sense. Y- you've heard we're that. The, we're, we're the only creature. Go. What were you going to say? You've heard that comparison of asking a woman, like, would you rather um, be alone in a room with a man or be alone in a room with a bear? You've heard of that uh-uh. trend, right? Well, that is a trend going on nowadays that I have. It's so sad to hear this is the case, but many women say that they would rather be in a room with a bear than a man. Very similar to what you're leading to when it comes to the elevator. Right. It's like, why put yourself in a situation? We're the only c- creature that has the ability to override our intuition because I don't want to hurt the feelings of the guy that could potentially rape me. Exactly. That's insanity. Yeah. And yet it probably happens daily. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> why does someone feeling guilt decide right. to go in the elevator? So the whole book is is essentially the author is pitching you to please listen to your intuition because it's more on point than we give it credit for. Oh, 100%. Now you have people on the other side, like I heard a CIA agent getting interviewed once and he's saying that that in their training there are circumstances where they do override their intuition. But I think in general for like just a common John Smith going on boardwalks living in Austin, Texas – you can probably listen to your intuition. It will lead you in the right direction a w- bulk of the time. When would you never listen? To, when would you not listen to your intuition? Um, typically, if you, I think he was talking about when they were um, building trust with an informant. 
mm. and trying to get information out of them, you treat that person differently than I would treat a friend that I am having dinner with. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Now, if you were, you know, trying to get out of a, a burning building, it would make sense to follow your intuition through that. But yeah, in this example where you're purposely having to mislead someone, that makes perfect sense. Your intuition is going to give you advice that you probably shouldn't follow. Right. But because we live in a society that does not follow their intuition, that is why that experience has to happen. If everyone followed their intuition, there'd be no need for probably the CIA in general, let alone the CIA having to mislead someone else. Yeah. Do you feel like you follow your intuition? Most of the time. When do you not? Um, when do I not? So this, the kind of guys that I'm attractive to, typically you can't tell that they're gay. Mm. And so there have been times where, and I also really want to meet someone organically, not on Tinder, Grindr, you name the app. I don't want to meet them through through there. So oftentimes when I hit on people, 11 times out of 10, they're typically straight. And they've always been, I've never had a bad experience. Every time I'll, I'll word it like, I'll go up to a guy in the grocery store and just be like, hey man, sorry to bother you, but is there any chance you want to go on a date? And they'll be like, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, man. I have a girlfriend. I've got nothing to be sorry about. You were super handsome. I figured I'd never see you again. May as well ask. Mm. And a couple of them have been like, dude, good for you. <laughs> a couple of them have been like, got the biggest smile on their face. They're like, oh, it's a huge compliment. Man. It's like, <laughs> like I, none of them have ever, oh, fuck off. You know, no one has ever said something unkind. But in, to answer your question and listening to my intuition, my intuition, but I don't, this is the thing. I don't know that it's my intuition that's flaring up, but I always get really, really nervous, as I think most people do when they hit on someone. I don't think anyone just hits on someone with no nerves at all. But for me, it's almost like a crippling fear where, like, I'll start shaking, I'll start sweating. I get so, so, so nervous. And it's like everything, every operating system in my body is telling me, like, that guy's straight. You're setting up yourself up for rejection. Do not talk to him. Go buy your ground beef. <laughs> and but and so i override that because i'm like well what do i really want if i really want to meet someone not through an app then that means leaving that front door and going out and speaking to people yeah and if i do if i like guys that are men manly men is who i'm attracted to then that's a risk i'm just gonna have to take every single time don't go to the ground beef area. Go to the sausage area. <laughs> That's what you're saying. It sounds like it just solved your problem. Thanks. Cool. Only buying sausage from here on. Exactly. That's so you'll attract the right. No, okay. I, I got a challenge here, David. Because okay, fine. Challenge, challenge away. I, I I deeply believe that all of us have that voice in our head. Like, oh, is it gonna be straight? I mean, I don't have that voice. I'm not. I'm not asking if he's straight, but like other people in your situation and others just have that pessimistic voice at all times like this isn't going to work out he's going to reject us whatever it may be um i encourage people to like do what they can to kind of quiet that voice like is that even quietable yes that's what meditation that's what breath work that's what going on long walks that's what all these things are for and in doing so you can override that intuitive voice with this mind or ego or conditioning voice and make the intuitive voice the driver's seat and i guarantee you the twitch is not going to set you up for failure and so what if, like, we rewrote those stories and said we're going to follow our intuition, and from now on, starting today, we will only be drawn to people that are gay and interested in us. What if we make that the story? And every time we go in a grocery store, I said, I am going, if there is a gay man who is single here that I'm attracted to, my intuition is going to find me. Like, isn't that also possible? E maybe. See, a lot of people... Do you think that's possible? I, I deeply believe that's possible. And so, 
not to compare myself to, to my relationship, but I, I didn't allow any other option to be the case. I said I no longer want to come across women that I don't want to marry. I'm only going to come across women that are capable of being my wife. And ever since that day, that's exactly what happened. See, a lot of us, we try to look at the world as if I'll believe it when I see it. Like I'm seeing reality is what it is. There aren't that many gay men who are my age and attractive and single. Or this, this, and that. When that's not actually the case, we think we are taking a valid, objective observation of our reality, but it's the opposite. We must think it or believe it before we see it, as opposed to I'll see it when I believe it. Hmm. And so if we operate life, and this is what I think is the largest misconception about life. I'm not saying I know everything about life at, at fucking 24 years old. But what I am saying is like, I've got this down, and I, and I feel it in my life right now, I'm living it. But if you say, no, I'm going to get ahead of the curve, and I'm going to tell life what I want from it, it will happen in every aspect. Hmm. And so if we simply just took the time to like write down exactly what we want in a partner, it can and will happen. Hmm. If you write down, I mean, I just bought a house, exactly what I want a house, it can and will happen. We just need to declare it for the world, and then it will show it to us. Yeah, This world is infinitely abundant. There's 8 billion people. And you're in Austin, Texas. Right. You can find another gay dude who's single and attractive. Right. And likes you. Right. That is literally maybe at this apartment complex. Right. And so fuck it. Like, why aren't the odds in your favor? I'm not saying you're going to find next time you go to a grocery store. Right. But I am saying is, like, once you read that story, it's a lot more likely to happen. I don't mean to, like, lecture you by any means or, or say oh this. Oh, no, I don't feel lectured. What I was sort of thinking about was, like, I do believe uh, I do believe that things can be manifested. Um, let's take this podcast as, as an example. I saw a coworker I'm trying to remember exactly how it went down, but I'm pretty sure he just said something. We crossed paths and hadn't seen each other in a few years. And he said, what's new with you? And I realized, like, absolutely nothing. Still working the same job. It's a good job. It's a top 10 professional services firm. Paid me decent. Um, graduated college. But, like, I had become that person who woke up, goes to work, goes to the gym, goes home, goes to bed. And, my, and, and I really hated that in that split second, I realized, sort of like when I asked people if they're happy, I was like, nothing in life is new and I don't want to answer this question. And so I said, I'm moving to Austin and starting a podcast. And he's like, what? And in my head, I think I was like, what? <laughs> and then it happened. So then <laughs> that was in July of 2022, I think. Yeah, 2022. And fast forward over the next 90 days, and any time anyone asks me, like, what's up with you, or any question where that could be the answer, I would say, I'm moving to Austin, and I started, I'm starting a podcast. So now I've realized I've told, like, 30 people this, and it's October now, and I'm like, if I don't do this, I'm a liar. Yeah. Almost like I've made this commitment now to myself more than them like, why have I been telling people this if I'm not going to follow through with it? So <laughs> I went on, like, apartmentfinder.com or some shit, put my name and phone number in there. This place calls me up. They send me a video of, like, the, you know, the, you saw it when you came in. I was like, oh, this place is beautiful. This is Austin. All right. So then similar to you, I either sold, gave away, or throughout everything I owned except for that dog and what I could fit in the trunk of my car. And the day after Christmas, we drove out to Austin, Texas. Fantastic. So I bring all that up to say, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to wrap my head around what you're saying, because I think we're saying something similar, but different because I, I'm bringing all this up to say, I do believe that there is a power to thinking, th saying things out loud, writing them down, reading what you wrote down out loud to yourself or in the mirror. I definitely believe in it. I guess I'm wondering, maybe I'm wondering why I'm having a hard time applying this to dating. Maybe it's almost like I've been single for so long. 
I'm telling myself like, no, this isn't possible. You can do that with the podcast. You can do that with your money. You can do that with your friends. But a boyfriend, no way, Jose. Exactly. That's limiting belief that we all have. <laughs> we all have it towards something, right? Right. And so let's talk about because I think what you did when it came to moving to Austin is the perfect example of what I'm trying to say. It's because you declared the world you're going to do something. Mm-hmm. And you probably did it out of social pressure. Like you didn't want to be seen as a liar. You don't identify as a liar, so you did everything possible, including selling most of what you own <laughs> and driving halfway across the country to prove to yourself you're not a liar, number right. one, which is okay. That's a, it's a, a, it's a decent way to get what you want out of life. Right. Um, but what you did was you, you declared what you're going to do, and then you did the next obvious step to make it happen. You went to apartments.com, whenever it was, searched your, your, what you would like, and you found it. And then you probably like looked at your stuff like, all right, sell, sell, give away, donate, whatever it is. And then you ended your lease, whatever you had going on there. You mm-hmm. did the proper steps necessary mm-hmm. to align what you declared with the world to it actually becoming reality. And this is the problem with manifestation in today's day and age is people say what they want, but they don't do anything to make it happen. Yeah. I assume because of the vision you had of, of moving to Austin, starting a podcast, it wasn't necessarily difficult or hard to make that transition happen. It seemed like it happened pretty spur of the moment. Mm-hmm. It seemed like it happened planned and aligned how it's supposed to. It probably what wasn't hard. The next step was obvious to you. Mm-hmm. That's the same for every aspect of life, for everything, especially the things we have living beliefs around. And so if our thing is I want – this boyfriend, I want this partner who looks like this, makes this much money, has this type of personality, whatever it is, whatever you value, if we write that down and then we ask ourselves, what does that person want in a partner? What type of person, what version of myself can I be Hmm. that would attract that type of person? So other than going out seeking and going to the grocery store and hang out the sausages <laughs> department twenty four seven, you know, from from open to close, no, we focus on the other list we just created of who I need to become to attract that type of person, hmm. and then naturally, when you become day by day incrementally become that person that your dream person will be attracted to, that that dream person you've always wanted to be, mm-hmm. you will attract those people. In waves. There will be so many men that you have to fight them off. I'm telling you, this is how life works. You know? So let's say like an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk saw his vision of what he wanted to do with his companies, with Tesla, with SpaceX, all these things. And he asked himself, what is the most simple, necessary first step for me to take? And then he's like, what's the next step for me to take? What's next step? What's the next step? And so he did that for years until a point where he had momentum and he was close to building what Tesla is today. And in doing so, he is now attracting everyone and everything to him. Hmm. He has infinite opportunities, infinite investors, infinite women, infinite everything because he had a dream so big and every single day he worked towards creating it. But he knew that he had to create himself into the engineer, into the marketer necessary to get there. And so that works for business and money. That works for relationships. That works for every aspect of life. It's much more simple than we think, but we allow our mind to get in the way and prove it that we don't deserve it. This is why people are poor. Hmm. They don't need to be. But it's a story they're telling themselves that they're unworthy of being rich. Right. And they, like we talked about earlier, they, they use an excuse of, oh, all rich people are miserable. Or mm. all rich people made their money in a dirty way, whatever it is, all these different reasons to allow them to stay where they're at. But why can't everyone be rich? They're literally printing trillions of dollars per year. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of money to go around for everyone. We can grab a few million. Right. And so all of our limiting beliefs are simply a belief in the mind where everything in this reality, including the universe as a whole, is constantly expanding. Which means there is definitely enough women That'd be attracted to me. There are definitely enough men that are attracted to you at this current state. But if you become a highest version of yourself, it'll be an ocean full. Hmm. And so it's all much more in our grasp than we think. And honestly, that's, that's what I kind of teach people to do. You know, so I write full time and I write about love, I write about spirituality, I write about 
feeling as if we're loved and enough can heal so much of the wounds for not operating from fear. But it also teach people how to become the best version of themselves through habits and beliefs that allow them to attract whatever they want to attract. Money, women, men, love. So yeah, man, it's something that um, I think society has told us that we can't have, but we're all deserving of having. Yeah. Hmm. So that was his nice way of saying, I'm the problem. <laughs> You're a great I'm podcast host, man. I'm You're listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now do some cocaine right. and hang out in the sausage aisle. Oh. Is what I'm saying. Oh man, no, you're you're you're. It, it reminds me uh, uh, of Ed's example of uh, the thermometer or the temperature gauge. Yeah. In yeah. case you guys don't know what that is, would you like to explain it? I can, if you haven't heard it. Go, in a while. go right ahead. Yeah. Basically, like I have my thermometer in here set for sixty-eight. It's where I'm uncomfortable, and if I am, the analogy is, is if you're getting successful in life, and that success looks like the gauge is going up 69, 70, 71, Those first few degrees, it's not a drastic change, and so you're still comfortable and you're okay with that success. But then when it gets to be like seventy-eight, seventy-nine, eighty, it's almost like, oh, I. I shouldn't have this podcast. I should probably stop recording episodes and get back down to where David should be of just working his nine to five, staying in his lane. And so you sort of subconsciously allow yourself to cool back down if you see yourself having too many successes. And it works on the other side as well, where then if I start, if I stop the podcast, I go back to my nine to five, maybe I start drinking more, smoking more, having a bunch of hookups, doing things that I know are not good for my soul, and I get down to like 50 degrees, I have the opposite realization of like, fuck, I've really strayed like down the wrong direction, and I get myself back up to that, that 68 degrees where I like to live. Um, and so you, you almost have to and I still have those thoughts. I had it four or five days ago where I was like, I, I, it, it comes from nowhere. I'll just be like walking the dog. I'll be like, no one is listening to the podcast. You should stop recording. And for the podcast, I just, I, I override that. I just, I just tell myself to stop thinking. I, I'm like, I don't know where that came from. I don't know why it came up, but it was wrong. It was not my intuition. And maybe I'll meditate on this for a few minutes, but I'm also just going to brush it aside as a weird thing and keep on recording i love that that's exactly what you do you let it go because those intrusive thoughts of this isn't worth my time podcast doesn't go anywhere no one's listening those aren't our thoughts that's our conditioning playing out so this is literally the reason why i tell people they're lovely enough every single day because it emphasizes and clarifies clarifies within their head whether that thought is coming from a place of love and truth or fear and lies and so why would anyone reasonably stop something they deeply enjoy doing mm -hmm. we said this port this we said before this podcast that if you have a podcast later in the day it's a good day mm -hmm. it's something you look forward to yeah and you really enjoy these conversations why would any reasonable human stop doing what they love that's not you that's not your human talking that's like conditioning we've been given our entire lives trying to convince us to lower that thermostat when there's no reason to we can crank that heat up to 100 and we'll become the person capable of Living loving that environment. Yeah. Exactly. I love that, man. Do you feel loved? I do, deeply. Do you feel like you're enough? I do. That's good. This is the first time in life I can say that. Going back to uh, to college for a minute, you brushed on this quickly, but I didn't want to set it. I didn't want to go by have it go by too quick. Before I get to Bali, actually, let me ask you one other thing. When did you first start drinking? I started drinking... Um, so, remember I told you the machete story? Uh-huh. That was the first day, full day of college. I started drinking the very night I don't, the very first night I was dropped off at college. And so I told my roommates, like, hey, yeah, I've never drank before. And then someone, of course, like a beautiful cheerleader across the hall, like, you never drank before? Come to my room. Hmm. Her parents stocked up, like, every alcohol imaginable. I think I had, like, Malibu for my first shot. So, my first day of college, which it was, and I quit drinking, um, about as soon as I moved to Austin, so about five months ago, and I don't feel like I'm ever going back. 
what did you, what did, do you remember how that night went and how you felt and what it did for you? I felt accepted in that moment because everyone in that dorm hall was cheering for me. Yeah, first drink, yeah. That's going to party this weekend. And so I immediately associated that action with that reward. And so that's oftentimes what happens in this life nowadays, you know. A rite of passage for a man is not to uh, accomplish something great, but it is to have the first sip of alcohol with her father or uncle or brother, whatever it is. And so because we make that association, if there's ever a time in our life where it just naturally happens where we feel less of a man or less like ourselves, we go back to those same actions that brought us a reward of happiness, glee, joy, empowerment. And so that's why alcohol is so big. And that's why in every alcohol commercial you see people partying every time. Right, everyone's they very attractive. That. And exactly, yeah. they, they want to reinforce that to you. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that, that was my first experience. And then it just kind of set me up as like, oh, this is the connecting with others drink. This is the, oh, I'm cool too. I'm enough too drink. They love me drink. And so that's what got me in that cycle for years, and I think does for many others too. How do you switch from it being a social thing to were you were you drinking alone? Yeah. At the end, that's where you know. Yeah. How do you make how that transfer happen from? I'm doing the socially. It's we're all cheering for each other, or for me, it's all about me. To I'm in my bedroom playing video games, drinking alone. How'd that happen? Yeah, I think. I l- was in love with the dopamine hit that I got in those social environments mm-hmm. where we're all drinking, having fun. That when I have a life where my 24 hours doesn't have any of those moments, I try to sprinkle a little bit of that dopamine hit in. And so in my mind, I made the connection between the dopamine hit and alcohol. And so I realized, especially during COVID, there's no parties to go to. There's no times for me to have this occasion with my friends and so i need to create that by myself Hmm. and so at the beginning i thought oh alcohol just do this for me and the first few nights are kind of fun you're getting a little drunk by yourself right it's not that bad the first few times you actually enjoy it yeah put on a funny movie put on a sports game whatever it is right it's it's all good but it happens over and over again and you're looking for that same hit but it never comes Hmm. and so that's how it i think evolved a big one for me was um taking edibles so like weed Mm -hmm. edibles Mm -hmm. That was my, my thing for a while, and I did that for every night for um, nearly years, I'd say. Now, how did you how did you know how did you come up with Bali? And also, why why did you have to sell everything versus going for a month? Like I know we talked about earlier, you listening to your intuition. Why do you think you went down that? specific route of getting rid of my everything and how did you choose bali specifically i think i so badly just wanted to start over and escape that's why i I sold everything gave away everything um bali in particular i remember those nights after i come home after working 12 plus hours a day on top of school when i was working way too much but i'd come home and i'd turn on um, my xbox and either play video games like assassin's creed for Five hours straight until 1 a.m. So I had to get up again at 5 a.m. Or, Ooh. yeah, it was ridiculous. It was so unhealthy. Um, or I'd put on YouTube. And finally I had some money for myself for once. And so I'm like, oh, now I can go on vacation. Because that's what people work for, right? Mm-hmm. Vacation. And so I remember holding up, like, the uh, the Roku remote to my, to my um, face every single night and just saying, YouTube, cool vacation spots. Okay. And it was just Bali, 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 Bali. Huh. I was like, this place is amazing. They live off 1500 a month. They got this lifestyle, this villa, this incredible food and everything. And I just became obsessed with it over the span of a few months. I watched every single YouTube video on it. I knew exactly what part of the island I'd want to live, the coffee shops I go to, the gyms I go to, the co-working spaces I go to. And I just became enthralled with what felt like an escape. And it just kind of wanted to cut ties. And so one, one thing about Bali is, you know, at that time, I, I would say I had like a edibles or a weed addiction. Bali, you get the death penalty if you bring in marijuana. So I'm like, mm. oh, I'll be away from my, dr- I'll be away from my vice. Mm-hmm. 
um, I'll be able to just be in the sun all day and, and surf if I want and <coughs> find some remote <coughs> job doing something online and just do that. And, um, yeah, so it, it became this escapism that we dreamed of, that I dreamed of. I think many people go through that where they dream of, oh, once I quit this job, once I get that raise, once I buy this house, once I buy that car, then everything will be okay. But then once you get to that island or you get to that car, that house, you realize, oh, I'm the exact same person. All same fears, all same insecurities. Mm -hmm. Nothing changed. Now you oftentimes have more expensive things to take care of. Or now I have nothing to my name. Now I have just my backpack to carry on. And so it was a unique lesson to learn. But, yeah, that's that's why Bali came up for me. And I'm curious how your experience there went because you went to Bali. Like, camera. So getting on a plane and flying somewhere does not shed all of those, like, character defects off of you. Exactly. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. So what? how long were you there for? I was there for... Um, I think 20 months in total. 20 months in total. So almost two years. What happened while you were there? So much. I feel like I got a crash course for life on this unique secluded island, right? And so not only was I exposed to a completely different aspect of life, a level of poverty I've never seen before, a level of um, just great humans I've never seen before. There are truly some fantastic people living there that despite having nothing to their name, are the most caring, giving people that I've ever witnessed. And so I've had that experience. I've been able to spend weeks sipping Mai Tais on the beach, which everyone dreams of, and realize, oh, that's kind of miserable after day eight. <laughs> you know, um, That's why vacation is vacation. You go back to normal. Right, thing. right. But, yeah, I, when I got there, when I first got there, I was, like, enjoying all the, the great parts of it. But funny, second day, I, I got a pretty – serious injury where the second day there I went body surfing in the ocean and then I, I crashed into a piece of coral and it left this huge gash in my like stomach like abdomen area right side of my hip and it was so uncomfortable and so I was walking outside of the the, the water onto the beach and I didn't really think anything of it just thought I'd maybe scrape something but then I see a bunch of Indonesian men keeping the face of oh and all the tourists were like, <gasps> and there's this huge, pretty much hole, it, it looked like, in my stomach that was gushing blood. So you didn't see it? You didn't look didn't, down? Didn't see it. And then they're like, oh, you go, you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to think of an accent, but they they rushed me to this, what looked like 14-year-old's moped, as he took me to the local hospital to get me bandaged up and patched up and everything. Um, but in doing so, after that all happened, and thankfully it all went well, and Surprisingly, despite the mold in the ceilings and the nurse looking like she's 16, she did a fantastic job, patched me up perfectly. I now had a very tough time sitting, tough time getting around, tough time going to the moped and all this. And so now I was in my room, alone, on the other side of the world, not knowing anyone, not knowing the language. And I just felt incredibly lost. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm the same person. I still want to go find a way to smoke weed or take an edible. I still want to go drink. I still want to order an Xbox in my room, play video games. I still want to do these things to escape because I wasn't confronting the thing that I needed to confront my entire life. And so the first few months were very hard, and I did very little. And when people would call home, they would be like, oh, yeah, you know, Bali's amazing. Look at the beach here. Look at this here. But inside, I was just miserable because I was the same person. And my escape, I realized, is just the same misery on a prettier background. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, thankfully over time, over a handful of months, I was able to finally go within and give myself that alone time to think about my life and things I wish I would have done differently and, more importantly, how I want to live my life going forward. And most importantly, forgiving myself for everything I did and did not do. And in that process of forgiving myself, it unlocked a level of freedom and love for myself that I didn't have prior. And in doing so, I felt as if I was no longer going to allow freedom, or excuse me, no longer allowed, allowed to ha have f fear running my life. And so that just flipped a switch onto everything. I started to take my life more seriously. I created community events like the Men's Circle, a bunch of business connections. I got on top of my health, so many other things. 
simply because I finally allowed myself the space to go within to confront the friction, to confront the fear, which we're all capable of doing. And what that process looks like is oftentimes going back to whether it's the huge moments of your life, the core moments, or just the minor moments that took place, different aspects, going back to those moments and reliving them, and now being okay to express them. And so if you witness something at seven years old that you should have cried about but you didn't, or at 72 years old, and it could have been any age, or you could have been angry at or could have laughed at, enjoyed at, but whenever those emotions were suppressed, it stuck with you and created a little darkness or a hole in your heart. And so intuitively, listening to that voice that I've always had, it instructed me on how to go back to that time in my life, live out those emotions, feel them, cry if needed, punch a pillow if needed, do all these things that allowed me to overcome them and let go of what happened to me. In doing so, I now felt as if so much of the fear that had paralyzed me my entire life, the fear of what other people thought, the fear of needing the approval of, of my parents, and the fear of all these different, different things, they were all just an illusion I created in my mind, just like the rest of us. I was not able to finally let go. And in doing so, one can live life, of what I call like so much offense, that it's offensive. And it is the only life I believe that's worth living. And this is, like you asked yourself, like, <coughs> in the beginning of the podcast, like, if we had six months to live, a bit of cancer diagnosis, whatever it may be, how do you want to spend your life? That's what we are able to live like once we have drained out all the fear through past emotions that weren't expressed. Hmm. And so n by no means am I perfect now, but I would say the far majority of emotions I've, I've dealt with and thankfully, I've been able to live life with offense. And that is why people like you, people, other people close to me, see my life moving very quickly. And thankfully, in my favor. Because I can now look at the world exactly how it is without my mind trying to can create stories about how it is. And I'm able to operate in a way that feels aligned. And I wish that for every human. Because I believe it is a deep, real human experience. So... so Sorry to get you off. Long story short, that's our learning bubble. I learned that I can take back control of my life and take back the power that the conditioning around us has taken away from us. So when you were <coughs> reliving some of those moments, like the ones you said that either evoked some sort of emotion, whether it was tears or anger, whatever it may be, were you were you alone? Yeah, I was alone. And was it just a matter of almost like a meditation of just thinking about your life and sort of going through all those memories and figuring out which which ones just like were holding space in your head and then trying to figure out why it was holding space in your head? Yeah, exactly. And so you know, thankfully, there's not that much to figure out because once we get quiet, once we you know, I was resistant towards it for most of my life. Once we start to meditate, once we start to give our, our mind a break, we are naturally supposed to experience those past experiences again to let them go. And so naturally, we'll start to think about, through meditation, that experience you have when you're 9 or 19 or whatever age it was where mm -hmm. you inflicted trauma because naturally it'll come back up to the surface for you to finally express if you just listen to it and allow it to happen. And so thankfully it wasn't like this game of searching of what did happen when I was nine. No, it, it will come to you in the order of operations necessary that it wants you to feel. And so, you know, I, I didn't really share that much of this to, to anyone in my life, including my parents. Like there are a few people that passed away in my life, um, early teens, mid teens, especially in college where I had, um, you know, grandparents, but that was, that was more known. And, um, that was somewhat you know, socially acceptable to get an older and just what happens. Um, but for some reason, I never cried, despite me having a deep, loving connection with them. Never cried. So, so I knew that was bottled up. But then there was also things that I decided to shun for most of my life where people in college that I knew committed suicide. Mm. People in middle school that I knew committed suicide. There were people that overdosed on drugs. There were um, some atrocious things that I witnessed 
all through my life that I just kind of swept under the rug. And it was until I decided, which I understand it sounds hard, it's not easy, but until I decided to relive those moments and literally close my eyes and imagine what it was like where I was when I either heard the news or experienced firsthand what happened. What was around me? What did I look like? How, what did it sound like? What did it smell like? What happened? And then allow myself to go back there and in quote-unquote real time cry if needed, be angry if needed, in some cases be joyful if needed. Once I did that and fully did that to the fullest extent, I didn't stop myself midway of crying because men aren't supposed to cry, whatever it is. Like I let that emotion go out. That experience no longer had any control over me. It had no power over me. I'm no longer a victim in those environments. I let that experience go. I have evolved from it. And so in doing so, whether we think it or not, these are the reasons that we have learning beliefs in life. These are the reasons why we so badly want to start that business or get in shape or whatever else it may be, but we're not allowing ourselves to do so. It is because we have these holes in our heart, darkness in our heart, that has not been cleared out yet, that is stopping us from obtaining those things we so deeply love through a loving lens. Hmm. We can still get anything we want in life through lens of fear. This is what all the miserable rich people did. Or, we can do it from love. So instead of using that pain and that suffering and that experience as motivation, my X, Y, Z never loved me, therefore I make more money than they ever did or I you know, look better than they ever, whatever it may be. If we read that story from a place of love, we enjoy every single day of that process. Mm. And so if this podcast for you is coming from fully a place of love, which I believe it is, and not fear of, I need to do this, need to be successful to please this person, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You're going to love every step of the process, which is what you do. And in doing so, simply by putting out the repetitions and getting better and better every single time, which you have from now, from your first episode, mm -hmm. you will, as a byproduct, through loving it, accomplish anything you've ever could have imagined. And that goes for this podcast, it goes for anything else you want but it needs to come from a place of love. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's the one thing that society is avoiding, those hard conversations with oneself, but it is the answer to all of our unfreedoms. It is the answer to all of our suffering. And so that's exactly what I do with now those community events that I host, the men's circles once a week, where I have guys pretty much allow them the space to, to talk about these things that have happened to them and make sure it's okay to complain. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. Because it's all needed to overcome what happened. And if we, can, if we can heal men to the point where a woman is fully comfortable with any man in the elevator with her, that is where we'll create what I believe is the closest thing to heaven on earth possible. And we do that through healing men. Let's come back to healing men in a second. Okay. Why Austin? And how did you know it was time to leave Bali? My gut told me. Okay, so you're, you're getting better at listening to your intuition. Yeah, 100%. Okay. And so in Bali, after these things happened, after I expressed these emotions, when you do that, you're getting rid of all the garbage that your conditioning and your ego is feeding off of. The voice in your head telling you you can't do stuff. And so now the other voice in your head, your intuition, is becoming incredibly clear. And so I always loved my life in Bali. I was like, man, I kind of want to be here forever. I was looking at getting like citizenship. I was looking at all these other things. And then I had this voice in my head like, it's time to go back. It's time to go back. Got to go back home. There's more to do at home. How, many, how long was it there, do you recall? Did, like, did it take a couple days or a couple thoughts of hearing it before? It took me weeks before I listened to it. A couple weeks. And in those sp that span of time, I'm like, no, I'm going to stay here. I love this life. Life in Asia is so cool. I have good friends, build a community, whatever it is. And at the same time, I was getting a voice. It took weeks. But in those weeks, my life began to decline. I got sick for no reason. 
Hmm. I wasn't changing up my diet. Was eating anything funny? What's happening? It's a lot in Bali, whatever it is. Like, still doing well, but I got sick. My moped started to break down, got a flat tire, whatever it is. Like, all these other things hmm. were going against me. And that happened for weeks upon weeks until I could barely get out of bed. I was so sick. But then I said in my mind, all right, it's time to listen to my intuition and move to America. Move back. As soon as I made that distinction, my sickness went away. Hmm. Everything in my life that was going terribly all of a sudden was remedied literally in the snap of a finger overnight. And so I realized, like, shit, okay, I got to listen. I'm like, where in America do I want to go? Don't want to go back to Vegas. Austin, Texas. How'd you, how'd you land on Austin? That was what Intuitive Voice said. Really? Yeah. So you didn't talk to anyone about it? No. I knew Joe Rogan was here. He, he said <laughs> a lot of cool things about it. Um, but I'd never been here before. Didn't know anyone that was currently living here or ever from here. Yeah. Um, and then it was funny, you know. Okay, I'll tell you. So I wrote this, this love letter, which is my daily newsletter, a while back that explained the story. But what happened was one night I said, oh, I really need to go back to America. So I was crying that night because I had to leave my life here. I had a dog, I had a villa, I had all sorts of things that I love. So the next day I'm like, all right, let's go apartment hunting. I'm like, Austin, Texas seems like a really good place. I started searching apartments. I'm like, oh, this place would be awesome. Everybody be, oh, this is awesome. They got a river right in the middle of the, <laughs> river. the, the city. I've never had, I live in a desert my entire life. This is so cool. Look at the greenery. Look at the, I love comedy. Look at all the comedy shows. Yeah, yeah, do. yeah. I'm like, Okay. And this is, you know, very first day of committing to go back to America. After I'm done researching, doing all the things to book my flights back, whatever it was, I drive my moped to what would be the men's circle host that night, the local co-working space. And as I'm driving my moped, I run across this traffic jam, which happens all the time. Some dude's shitty pickup truck had the, the bed loose and a bunch of coconuts just rolled out in the street. You can't really drive... It's Coconut Street. It feels like Mario Kart, right. you know, and if you with real, <laughs> real repercussions. And so it was a huge traffic jam. But when it's finally my turn to turn on the street through the, the coconuts as I'm walking my moped through it, a guy to my right grabs my attention. And it was this rice farmer. And rice farmers there, you know, have very little to their name. Maybe a pair of flip-flops and an old shirt. And they got their rice, their cows. That's, that's their life. But this guy, for some reason, had on a brand new shirt that said GVR on it. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, it's a, it's a beautiful lime green brand new polo shirt. It's a GVR. And that symbol, I look closer. Again, I'm holding up traffic at this point because I'm right in the middle of this intersection trying to navigate the coconuts. A bunch of Indonesian farmers and like businessmen are like honking at me like, go, go, go. But I'm like, what? It's on his shirt. I look closer and it said, Green Valley Ranch Resort and Casino, Henderson, Nevada. Hmm. That shirt was a employee shirt from the resort and casino maybe four miles from my house in Vegas. And so not like I'm in L.A. right now. I am literally on the other side of the world. And this rice farmer that has nothing to his name happens to have the uniform of a company that's located four miles from where I grew up, right down the street, the same place I used to go watch movies at, same place I used to hang out on the weekends, is that. I'm like, that is odd. Like, but why is that happening? And so I'm thinking about that. Okay, I'm driving to the co-working space. I'm like, why did I just see that? I roll up to the co-working space. I park my moped, and another guy, um, looks like he's probably early 30s, um, is, is at that co-working space at 7.30 night, which is around the time it starts. And no one's really at the co-working space unless you're there for the men's circle. And so I go to myself, I introduce myself, say, hey, welcome to the men's circle. Thank you so much for coming. What's your name? He's like, oh, my name's Preston. I'm like, wait, oh, it's not American. There's not, the, there's not that many Americans in Indonesia. It's it's me and maybe two others out of millions of people um, because the other side of the world. I'm like, oh, you're American. Where are you from? He's like, I'm from Austin, Texas, <laughs> born and raised. I'm like, I mean the place I just researched for like four hours right before I came here? 
that I'd never heard of prior, but now I just have the gut <coughs> feeling I should go to. I said, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. And so he, it's like, you got to move, bro. If you get in the sign to go, you're going to love it. You should do it. And so he pretty much sold me on it within half an hour before the circle started. And so now I'm sitting in the circle, got Preston on the left, the guy from Austin, Texas, and a bunch of randoms in the circle that I'm about to leave. And then midway through the men's circle, I, I decided, you know what, let me bring this topic to the circle. I'm like, I love my life here in Bali. I created a legit community and brotherhood. But for some reason, I feel as if I need to go back to America. I have the gut feeling I need to go. And I said, you know, I was born and raised in Las Vegas. I left there. But now I feel like I need to go back. For some reason, I live in Austin, Texas. And then another guy to the right of me, who looks like he's from Central America, some sort, which is what a lot of people there are from, Central America, Australia, Europe, whatever it is. He's sitting right next to me, and he says, brother, you live in Las Vegas? It's like, I've been living in Henderson, Nevada for the past four years. And I'm like, and number one, another American. Uh-huh. Number two, he said, yeah, yeah, right next to like Coronado High School. That was my rival high school. And so they, it could not have been six miles from my house. And so I'm like, you're telling me I had the, the GVR shirt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A guy from Henderson, mm-hmm. a guy from Austin, all in the same 45-minute window across the world from where all those places actually are. The coincidences that just took place are unfathomable. Right. Like, it's not possible unless it's meant to be. And so as I'm telling people, I'm thinking I'm going to move back, and this guy says, oh, I'm from Henderson. I'm like, okay. All right. God, universe, intuition, I'm listening. I'm moving back. And so that's what I did. And a handful of weeks later, found someone from my villa, dog, all those things. And then now I'm back here. I arrived to Vegas. And I'm like, I really think Austin's the place. I wrote down exactly what I wanted in an apartment. Went to apartments.com, put in the filters. First one I saw, I'm like, oh, that's the one. I've been looking for years. I arrived here, stayed in Airbnb for a few nights, and then toured this, that apartment complex. I go, that's the one. I've been living there ever since. And I've been loving it. Yeah. Yeah, you have a, a girlfriend that you're in love with. Yeah. You just, bu- just bought a house. Just bought a house. I'm sort of sk- going to skim over the good things that have happened and just rushing into them because I want people to see the example that you've been living and know that you're feeling very fulfilled in more the way than one. Um Maybe we'll have you back for a part two and we can talk about Austin more and m- life and whatnot. But there's something I want to touch on before you leave tonight. Of course. You said that men need to heal. Yes. Some statistics that I'm not sure if you've heard before. Um, and let me find one specific one real quick. Okay, okay, I found it. In uh, 2021... 12.3 million adults seriously thought about suicide. 3.5 million adults made a plan to commit suicide. <clears throat> 1.7 million adults attempted suicide. And in 2021, 48,183 people committed suicide in the United States only. Fast forward to 2022, 40, that number increased to 49,476 people. We saw a 2.6 rise. Um, we don't have numbers for 2023 yet, um, but another interesting, I don't know, interesting might be the wrong word, but three point, of those 40, let's just call it 50,000, let's round up, of those 50,000 suicides, there are 3.85 more men committing suicide than women. So the breakdown was that it was 40,000 men, essentially 10,000 women that took their own lives. And of all of those 50,000 suicides, 68.46% of them were white males. Now, you and me are not doctors, psychologists. We are just two dudes talking. So I will remind the audience that, that we're just two dudes riffing about our own life experience and things that we've observed. But based off those statistics, I would say that your claim or your statement that men need to heal is wildly accurate, and we need that healing to come sooner than later. What, what, 
from your observation, that actually, let me just pause there. What's your thoughts around what I just read to you? It's deeply sad. As someone who sees now in their life a million reasons to live, mm -hmm. it saddens me that so many people, even those that aren't talked about in these statistics, find a million ways to die every day. Yeah. And uh, I feel as if I believe we have been prompted or given a version of reality that isn't true, that isn't right that isn't destined for our human experience. And in doing so, we've devalued the life of humans in general, but especially men, in particular white men. We're trashed. We are um, shipped off to war, oftentimes pointless wars over money and resources. And then we come back to people blaming us, hating us, with little opportunity devaluation of the dollar, so every dollar we do save is becoming more and more pointless throughout the day. The food that we are advertised to eat is poisoning us. The media we're consuming is poisoning our mind, making us feel as if everywhere outside our doorstep is a war zone and unsafe. It's harder than ever to date. It's harder than ever to afford having fun. Our current society, especially in America, has made it incredibly hard to be a man. And so, to be honest with you, with the reality that's pitched upon us, it makes sense with those numbers like that. I empathize with every man who feels that way. I understand why they do it. If I were in their suit, their same shoes, I'd feel the exact same way. That being said, I believe we are all here for a reason. That our lives are not pointless. And I'm here to teach men that they did not control what happened to them. But it is their responsibility get through it. And we are so much more capable of leading a better future for ourselves and the next generation of men and women. And waking up every single day despite everything going against us and choosing And choosing to walk the walk and become a man that the world needs who can and will have a better tomorrow. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's deeply worth it. And I promise you the way to get there is to run towards what we've been avoiding. You know, for years, part of our conditioning is to not face our emotions. If you cry, you're weak. Mm -hmm. That's not the case at all. That is, what kept, that is what has kept us trapped. So I believe the first step is to balance strength and what men are truthfully, cap truthfully capable of with compassion for ourselves and others. And the next iteration of mankind, in particular men, be finding this balance of brute force and empathy. And I think it's a fine line that we're all capable of walking. We just haven't been shown that it's an option. And so in doing so, it'll take having to say no to a lot of what society's telling us to be. We'll also have to say no to being shamed because we're not worthy of it. 
We're doing the best with what we can with what we've been given. I believe that with every man. Now is the time, in some extent, to start a revolution. But it's not a revolution that's going to lead to more fighting and more war. It's a revolution to start within. It is a revolution that empowers us to love ourselves when the world is telling us to hate ourselves. It is a revolution to somehow overcome a system that is trying to put you down. And there is no better story, no better movie, no better life worth lived than to find a way to love oneself and love all the mothers, daughters around you. And to become the highest version of yourself, not only for yourself, but for other men. To make the world a better place. That is worth overcoming. We've all fantasized about Batman <laughs> and those superheroes for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. we, we've all wanted to be those people that had all the odds against them, but find a way, found a way to persevere. But we don't realize that that is our life right now. We are all the main characters in our own movie. Mm. And not only can we overcome, what's been put in front of us, but we will overcome what's put in front of us. That's what happens in every movie, right? Mm -hmm. And if we believe we can, we will. And so I'm here to empower men. That's all I do. I don't tell them how to live. Sorry to interrupt. I don't tell them how to live. I just give them the tools necessary to design the life they've always wanted to live. Let's give them one tool now. You said, well, first off, you, you being here has been a tool for them. <laughs> this has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. I love when I get taught things on my podcast. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm the problem. That's my takeaway from no, this episode. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here tonight because I know that, that there could have been a million other things you could have been doing. So I'm extremely grateful that you would spend some of your time with me this evening. So thank you, first off. With that being said, one of the things you mentioned was balancing strength with empathy. So let's say there's someone listening tonight, and they're like, empathy? Yeah. What's, what's a way that you can practice empathy? You know, the judgment we have towards others is simply judgment we have towards ourselves. One who does not judge themselves is incapable of judging the world around them. They're incapable of judging the crackhead on the side of the street or the guy that robbed the bank the other day or whatever it may be. They're incapable of it because they're not doing it for themselves. And so what I would recommend any man to do is to sit with themselves, like we talked about before, and go back two points in their life where they were either the victim or, and this is very important, or the perpetrator. No matter what crime you've committed, no matter what mistreatment you've done to another human being, it's time to forgive yourself. It's time to show empathy towards yourself. It is time to overcome that lesser version of you that committed it. And you do that by letting go and forgiving. And so when I say provide strength with empathy, I'm saying provide empathy for yourself. Because if you walk around having less judgment for what you've done in the past, and less judgment for the situation you're in today, you will have less judgment for the world around you. Nothing from our past, good or bad, should ever define who we are today. Mm. And so empathizing with the version of yourself that <coughs> used to be is exactly what I mean by that. And so when you do that, you'll have a lot more empathy towards your girlfriend, your kids, your employee, whatever it may be. And the world will be a better place because you went within and finally forgave yourself and loved yourself and felt enough for yourself. 
I wonder if you'll agree with this. I have a friend um, that will remain anonymous that he's come up a few times on the show, but he had a older brother who died at 32 years old two weeks before Christmas Day a couple weeks, a couple years ago. And um, fast forward two years, give or take, and we were driving together and we had some time before we were getting to our destination and it was just the two of us. So I wanted to take advantage of the, the privacy and just said, hey, how, you, how have you been doing with this? And we talked about it for a while, but one of the things that he said that was really interesting was I could tell he was he wanted to cry and he was fighting with everything in him to hold it back. And I was like, brother, it's just me in here. Like, if you want to let it out, like, I'll probably cry with you. But, like, go ahead. Like, it's just me. I don't give a fuck, you know. Allow yourself to cry. And he's like, well, I, I don't cry because that's not how my dad raised us. He raised a man. And so I wonder if even one, you know, maybe you can't do it in this moment while listening to the podcast, but the next time something comes to mind that the emotion it elicits is tears or rage, sort of like what you were saying, allow it just to come out. Stop fighting it and, and thinking that you need to hold that back because of how you were raised, because you don't look cool, because that's not what culture tells us we should do. Just let it out. Exactly. I think that you can have those moments intentionally, like what you were doing in Bali. But I've also hit, had moments where sometimes something will be driving and something will come to mind. And f 10 seconds later, I'm ugly crying, you know? Yeah. So just how, how does it feel after you're done crying? Uh, it often feels like there's a weight lifted off my shoulders. Exactly. Yeah. You feel lighter. Yeah. And so this is what I recommend because life's in throw – throw experiences in your way as a man that we can't show our emotion right when that happens, right? Let's say you're on a work call and some employee says something offensive to you and you're angry at them and you want to be like, well, fuck you, well, whatever it is. No, we can't do that. We need to function in society. So this is what I do if that were to happen to me. If it is acceptable, I tell them, I do not like what you just said. That angered me. If it's not acceptable, or if for some reason they can't hear you, whatever it may be, I said to myself, I'm angry in this moment. I don't like what you just said. And then after that call is done, after I'm in a place where I am not a presence that would disrupt someone's safety, I allow myself, oftentimes in private, but now oftentimes around people that I deeply love, and I go punch a pillow. I go run. I go just yell fuck into a pillow, whatever it is. And I get the anger out of that moment. This also happens with sadness. Right? There's moments in my life where tragedy has, has struck. I need to be there for others. But then I make sure, very soon after, I give myself the space to cry. And so it's being selective with and intentional with when and how you let your emotions out. Yeah. But make sure they get out because that same cycle that you just talked about with your friend and his father said, men, don't cry. That is exactly what's creating the hole in our heart, the darkness in our heart. That's perpetuating these cycles to continue. And if that cycle continues, those numbers of suicide rates that you showed me earlier mm -hmm. are only going to rise. Mm -hmm. That is the reason for it. And the more our society can get better at expressing our emotions in a healthy way, we will see less wars, less domestic violence, less violence as a whole. And society will feel more human again. Because that's what we're allowing ourselves to do, be more human. Imagine, if you would, that tonight, not tonight, when this podcast goes live, a guy or a girl, a human, slightly longer, younger than you, goes and fires up whatever video they gain, they're playing currently, they popped an edible, and they put this podcast on in the background. And over the course of the, the, these two hours, the game has been turned off and they are 100% captivated by this conversation as they see someone in you that's a couple years ahead of them that is living the life they wish they were living and not doing what they're doing right now. And you can look into that camera and you could speak to them for a minute. What would you tell them? That is the greatest question I've ever been asked, by the way. I'll go ahead and look at the camera. Um, 
to the person who is currently playing video games on some type of substance. What's happening here is that we are trying to find every thing possible to numb ourselves, to escape from the present moment because we do not like where we're at, what we're doing, or who we are in particular. The one piece of, of advice I would give, because as David said, I was once in this situation. I would make the intentional effort as if my life depended on it because it does. And I would give myself the space throughout my day to be silent. I would give myself the gift of solitude. I would sit down at the edge of my bed with no distractions, with no music on, no video games playing, no Netflix, whatever it is, no phone in sight, and just sit there. And do it for a longer period, do it for an hour. Because after about 20 minutes in, that monkey mind that's going on about the homework, you got to do the email, you got to write whatever it is, it's all going to go to the wayside. And what actually needs to come up will come up. And in doing so, it's going to be unpleasant. More than likely. Of course it is. That's why I've been avoiding it my entire life. We've done it subconsciously. But now it's time to finally face it. Because immediately after you face it, like David just said, you're going to be feeling much better. You're going to feel much lighter. And over the long term, clearing out that garbage of junk emotions we've been holding on to our entire life Clearing that out is going to allow us to finally become the person we want to become. Finally muster up the courage to, whether it's post those videos online or start that business or finally get in great shape or finally have the courage to walk up to the girl in the grocery store or guy. It's going to empty out all of our limiting beliefs, all of the shame and guilt that we've held on our entire life. And it is going to be a, the key to a life of joy, bliss, and fulfillment. And I know me saying these words at this point of time feel like a pipe dream. Something that can never happen. Something that only happens in movies. But I promise you, this is what humans are meant to experience. We're not meant to be miserable. We're not meant to be depressed. We're not meant to be suicidal. Of course not. How would life be created if we we're supposed to end it prematurely? doesn't make any sense. We know better. And so the sooner we muster up the courage to simply be alone with our own thoughts and more importantly our feelings and emotions is the sooner we are to live in the life that we're destined to live. Aligned with the highest version of ourselves. Where we attract the business, we attract the woman, we attract the friends, we attract everything we ever could imagine. And it's much closer. All we have to do is give ourselves the space for the quieter voice in, in our head that's always been there to speak up a little bit louder. And we'll listen to that quieter voice, the voice of our intuition, the voice of God. And we'll let this other voice, the one that's always going on 24-7, telling us all the fears, and all the things we can't do, we we'll allow the voice to fall the wayside. And make that smaller voice the driver. And if that smaller voice, the voice of intuition, becomes a driver, it will guide us and drive us down a path we've always wanted to go down to our dream destination. And it will do so effortlessly, and you will enjoy the ride. And so all it takes is just getting silent. And so I challenge you the 22-year-old version of Cameron to do just that. The older version, you'd be very proud of you. That's it, Dave. Well done. Thank you for that. Of course. Well, before we start closing this thing out, is there anything else you wanted to talk about tonight that we haven't brought up yet? Can I ask you something you asked me earlier? 
do you feel loved and feel enough? I do. Yeah, I do. You know, being single, there are definitely some days where um, if I'm being fully transparent, it does get a little lonely in here. I find that it's often too sometimes when people, when we end the podcast, it just feels very quiet in here. And there's a big part of me that wish that, you know, there is someone in the other room just ready to, to share in the moment. It's just like, that is a great episode. And I don't know. It, it just, there's something about right when a podcast ends, almost like the adrenaline rush from recording is so high that then, you know, it, I think it's a similar feeling. Um, they, they say that like musicians have, you're on stage, people are cheering you on, everything's loud. And you're by yourself in a hotel room. <laughs> like yeah. It's such a switch of, of atmosphere. Um, and so I do have moments here in the apartment specifically when um, it just feels quiet. You know, and it'd be like, man, sure would be nice if someone, if someone was here right now. But one thing I will say when it comes to, um, you know, to feeling, to feeling loved is uh, little things like what I was telling you about earlier, the phone call from the, the guy in the walking group. That that kind of stuff is happening more and more, and I I really have loved where my personal life has gone in Austin. And in less than two years here, I feel like I've made some better quality friendships than I did in thirty plus years in California. Um, I think it's a product of both me growing, but also being in a city where the kinds of the five people that I want to surround myself with, I'm finding them. Yeah. Um, and that's not a dump on Cal. I'm not trying to <laughs> dox my hometown. You're all shit. It's not like that at all. I Like I said, I think it's a combination of two things, both my personal growth, me changing, um, and also making proactive decisions about who am I going to hang out with, why am I going to hang out with them, how am I going to spend my time, things like that. So um, in general, though, yes, I do feel loved and do I you do feel, feel enough. Do you feel worthy of that person who could be waiting on the end of this room? Oof. You know, you given me something very big to think about, and it was um, honestly, I'm gonna have to re-listen to it because podcasting is weird. I almost like black out. I need to re-listen to the part where you were talking about creating the list of like, am I ready to show up for whoever that person is? That's a tough question to answer. I don't know why I don't want to say yes. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not ready. That's okay. Yeah. Well, the moment you are, you'll know it. Yeah. And the moment you are, you'll attract it. Yeah. And literally the moment you are, that's when that person will show up. Yeah. But it's all in your control. It'll happen. Yeah. I, I trust it'll happen. You have some tough questions, sir. You would make a good podcast. You are. I haven't listened to any of your show yet. I, I think I told you I was debating if I was or wasn't going to because sometimes I like to go into these interviews blind. So I decided to wait until after we spoke yeah. before listening to your show. But I would bet, based off of how you showed up tonight, you're a very good podcast host. Thank you, my friend. To be honest with you, I haven't recorded an episode in over a year. Um, it's something that I started while in Bali and then stopped after about a dozen episodes. Um, but it's something I will be bringing back the next handful of months and doing very consistently. I really admire your podcast and your consistency with it. That's something I want to do because, yeah, I mean, as you know, just it feels like magic sometimes and we yeah. lose track of time when we're, when we're doing this and it's something I really want to bring back in my life. So I appreciate that. Don't watch old ones. Wait for the new ones. Okay, and I'll, and wait I'll for send the new ones. Um, they're going to be good. They're going to be your quality type podcast. So Aww. they're going to be great. That's but a very um, kind word. I appreciate that. Of course, my friend. But, uh, yeah, I really, really appreciate being able to hop on. I've been yeah. wanted this for so long, and yeah, you're just such a fantastic guy, and uh, I'm very happy with what you're building here. I pre Thank you, man. That's very kind of you to say. Um, I can't wait for those episodes. Great. So I'll be, I'll be, I'll be watching and waiting. You can be on one of them if you like. Sure. Uh, I don't know. You have some tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> you better be ready to <laughs> cry, on brother. Spotlight here. You're ready to cry. <laughs> um, we have a closing tradition that I started in 2024 where as I'm listening to podcasts that I enjoy, if the host asks a question I really, really like, I jot it down and I'm asking them of my guests just because I'm curious how you are going to answer. I never, I pick them out here on the spot because I sort of base it off of the conversation that we had. So the one that I'm going to throw at you. Mm, Oh, here's yours. 
what is the most interesting and revealing question David should have asked you but didn't? What is the point of life? Something simple, something easy. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I think what is the point of life? It's a great question because you understand how people view this human experience that we all feel like as if we involuntarily signed up for. Some people will tell you it's hookers and cocaine. And other people tell you, oh, it's, you know, have fun with friends. Yeah. Um, and it tells you a lot about the person. Um, it's a fantastic question that I don't even know the answer to. I think it makes it a great question. But um, that's the one thing. But I think you, you, you kind of did that in other ways. Like, all of these questions that we asked, the foundational question is, what is the point of all this? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly happy that was went, my friend. And I'd love to be back sometime if you'd love. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm going to bring for my topic on the walk on Saturday? What is life? What is the point of life? Awesome. <laughs> just get off to the races, 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Last week, I think one of the guys' topic was like, um, it was something like the crash of the current political landscape or something. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the girls was just like, well, oh, good morning to you, too. <laughs> I'm going to be that guy this week. I, I was in that group when that <laughs> happened. I remember that. Wait, wait, what I was, was the topic? It was like, um, talk about the current political conflicts conflicts that we're facing. Oh, was that what it was? Yeah, yeah. And he was like, well, good morning. <laughs> that, that reaction like, was on. made me chuckle. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. I think most people probably like stray away from you if you see that. But then some will be like, oh, it's time. They've been waiting for someone to prompt them that. Yeah. And so I'm excited to see what reactions or conversations. What is the point of life? Question. No one's going to talk to me this week. <laughs> or everyone. We'll see. Or everyone. Or yeah. Everyone. The no. Cameron, this is. Do you prefer Cameron or Cam? My close friends call me Cam, so go ahead and call me Cam. Cam, oh, close friends, status, <laughs> guys. That's what's up. Let's go. Yeah. Cam, the man. This has been so good. Thank you again for showing up tonight. Um, to the audience, if you guys enjoyed this episode, or if you believe it could have an impact on young people throughout the U.S., we we I know for a fact that there's a strong group of listeners that are between like 12 and 32-ish who could be in Cameron's spot right now. And the only way that y they're going to hear his message and his story tonight is we did our job. We came, we talked. Now I need you to do your job. Take three to five minutes to go onto Spotify, leave the show a five-star review, go onto Apple Podcasts, leave a written review, and then go on to YouTube, subscribe to the channel, or take this episode and share it with someone. Um, and, and just, you know, let them know, I really love this episode, would like you to listen. Um, but if you guys would do a couple of those things for me, it's free. And if you do that for me, I promise you that I will continue to bring you the guest best that I best guess, excuse me, that I can find in Austin, Texas, and we'll continue to have um, entertaining stories, motivational stories, stories that will light that internal fire within you, the listener. Thank you so much, guys. I love you. Stay healthy, stay happy, and we'll see you next Saturday night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>